So I'm a 21-year-old French girl, and I'm sorry about my English. I'm also a student in Lille, France. So, tired of not finding true love, I decided to lose my virginity with my best friend. Then I found a fantastic hookup friend, which I get along with wonderfully on all levels. And we were together for about three months. But it was around this time that they then say that they still love their ex. So being fragile as I was, I actually attempted to take my own life. I go to the emergency ward and then the mental hospital as well. For the smart ones among you, you'll have to understand that I was already depressed for a few months. Under treatment is what I mean, with a strong penchant for alcohol as well. And to complete this auto-destruction mechanism, what better way than dating apps, right? So, a few weeks after my release from the mental hospital, I match up to make some new encounters and I forgot about my dear and tender hookup friend. I always meet guys at their home for a first date because I have zero experience and that's what I did for my very first date too. So one day I match with this guy and let's call him Matthew. Matthew's not a, a very handsome guy and has a few extra pounds but I'm not Beyonce either let's be honest so I match him. We laugh a little bit, we have some common tastes and he smokes some weed so I thought well perfect. We can plan to smoke and then we can just, you know, get it on. He gives me some personal information, like his address. No idea if it's the real one, mind you. And his job, or rather old job, I should say. He just got fired, apparently. But work or not work, to be honest, I just didn't really care at this point. I don't want to do my life with him anyway. It was just a, a quick hookup. So I explained to him that... I'm a bit fragile on that I came out of a, a kind of mental clinic, that I'm depressed and blah blah blah. It's all for the sole purpose of making him understand that he shouldn't play with me. I also tell him that I'm looking for just a fun time, but still with some discussion and some hugs and whatnot, and not just a shot in like 20 minutes and it's done sort of thing. He assures me that that is what he is looking for too, and that he's actually very cuddly and so I thought perfect. After one or two days of discussion, we agreed on a date, a mojito party at my house, and he can bring some joints. Matthew arrives, and he is not cute at all, even worse than in the photos. He has a, a dirty look like greasy hair, stained t-shirt. It was like the style of a teenager who didn't know how to dress himself, despite him being 26 years old. In short, I'm far from excited, but I desperately need the company. I offer to make him the drinks while I choose a film on television and he runs and passes on the kitchen side to prepare two mojitos before joining me on the sofa. We talk a bit. He's not very smart and not very interesting either. I drown in my drink hoping to animate the party alone. But this is where there is a three-day blackout. So... According to dear Matthew, we would have drunk and smoked while watching a film before going into the bedroom. I vaguely remember being naked on my bed and seeing him dressed above me, looking at me before turning his heels and just slamming the door. My phone is discharging and my alarm clock is not ringing. I'm away from a work group appointment so my friends are worried and they call me. They can't contact me so they contact my sister but she also goes to voicemail. The girls apparently come down from my house and ring again and again, but there's no answer. They call the fireman who managed to open the bottom door, but not the door to my apartment. They knock on the door calling me and I end up opening the door, dressed in a blanket to hide my nakedness. I look at them with just what they described as incomprehension. The firemen conclude that I'm hungover and break up while my friends help me get dressed and whatnot. They also think that I drank too much. But they notice that my body is covered with what looks like yellow betadine on my arms, legs, stomach, etc. I told them that I burned my arm yesterday and that I wanted to heal myself, but there was no sign of a burn or anything on my arm. Besides, I don't even have betadine. They take my cat and take me back to one of their houses since I'm in just a completely comatose state. I have trouble speaking, I look completely elsewhere as anaesthetized, and I even seem to have trouble thinking. The next day, my sister comes to pick me up so that I can stay with her for a few days. 
Everyone is convinced that I tried to end my life again with drugs or alcohol or something, but I try to tell them that that wasn't the case. But I start complaining about pain in the vulva area and blood loss as well. My pill stops my period completely, so my sister takes me to the hospital at this point. I explain to them that there may have been unprotected sex since I was well, pretty much unconscious. There is an AIDS vaccine and stuff that you can get and I'm advised to file a complaint and I'm being redirected to the OB emergency room. The next day I finally regain consciousness gently and my relatives see it right away. I'm a little bit more lively and my remarks are a little bit more consistent. They meet me in the emergency place and I get swabs done and I get a preventative AIDS treatment. And so over the course of a week I made a series of appointments for blood samples, urine samples, etc. And I went to file a complaint with the testimony of my friends who met me at home and my sister who took care of me as well. And after talking about it around me to people my age, older people as well, but especially medical staff and the police, the term organ trafficking was more than mentioned. They think that the guy must have chickened out right at the last minute. So despite my complaint, my bed full of betadine, my underwear torn off and the blood on the doors of my apartment, which was weird right, my attacker apparently got nothing out of me in the end and I'll never know what really happened that night and I guess what he really wanted too. I would like to point out too that I used to drink and smoke in addition to my treatment and that never before had happened where I blacked out for like three days. But in the end, I got lucky that night. Thankfully, I didn't have AIDS or any sort of sexually transmitted disease and also thankfully, I didn't seem to have been sexually assaulted or anything. But I am pretty sure that he put something in my drink that night and that he had intentions to take something from me that I'm pretty confident on. When I was 16 or 17, I was coming home to Brooklyn from a movie in Manhattan with my friends. I was the only one who lived in BK, so I worked home from the train alone. I was used to being out late by myself. I had midnight curfew, but I frequently broke it because I didn't think nothing bad would ever happen to me. That despite an uptick of assaults and all sorts of stuff in our neighborhood at the time too. This night, however, I was actually slated to get home on time for once. It was the summer after I graduated high school and I was feeling amazing. I had a little to drink and a little to smoke and I felt like I was on top of the world. It was really hot out too and I remember that I was wearing this long sheer cape thing and a very tight and revealing little dress underneath. Not that anything would have probably been different if I'd been wearing shorts and a t-shirt anyway. However, because of my fun little outfit, I was feeling myself and being so stupid, taking selfies while I walked down the dark streets and listening to music with both headphones in, not paying any attention to my surroundings. I think I even sang as I was walking and... I got to my building after finishing my 10 minute walk from the train and walked up the steps to our apartment. We lived in a brownstone with apartments in it and ours was on the third floor. We had a gate at the bottom of the steps separating us from the sidewalk. I pulled out my headphones and began to fumble with my keys at the top of the steps. Just as I had found the correct key, still humming to myself and thinking about my great night, I heard the latch on the gate clank as if it were being opened. I turned around and I saw a man standing at the gate, staring at me. He was young, probably early 20s, wearing a grey hoodie with the hood up, covering part of his face. But I could see his eyes and immediately I knew that something was off because of just how blank yet nervous his expression was. One hand was on the handle of the gate as if he were about to open it completely, but stopped once I turned around. Somehow, my fight or flight instinct didn't kick in yet. It was probably the alcohol, I guess, but I cautiously called down, can I help you? And he didn't respond. I looked him over more closely and realized then that his other hand, the one not on the gate, was moving, fast, low, near his waist. I registered that 
He was actually touching himself, gasped, and within milliseconds, he was sprinting up the stairs behind me, reaching out his hand to grab me. My brain clicked into place and I started screaming at the top of my lungs as I jammed my key into the door and slammed it behind me. I ran up the stairs to my apartment screaming for my dad, not even stopping to make sure the door was locked, thinking that if he followed me upstairs, he'd soon be met by my very tall father and our very loud dogs too, who slept in the bedroom right next to our apartment door. But as I looked over my shoulder while tearing my way up the stairs, I saw his face pressed up against the glass window, still watching me, but now his eyes looked absolutely furious. I ran into our apartment, still screaming to my parents to call the police. My dad went downstairs and looked around, but by that time, he was gone. The police came anyways after my mum called and came upstairs to take my statement so that they could make their report. The two cops who showed up asked me to describe him. I did, and they said that they would cruise around looking for him, and regardless of if he was found, a detective would call me soon to make a more detailed report. But they never actually called me. There were many more sexual assaults and other assaults as well that continued to take place in my neighborhood for the rest of the summer even. And I shudder every time that I think about what would have happened if I hadn't taken out my headphones before I began unlocking that door that day. I don't know how long he was following me for and as far as I know he was never caught either. But from that point on, for those last few weeks before I left for college, I would call my dad and make him meet me at the train station so that he could walk me home safely. Now, as an adult too, I am far more cautious than I was as a teenager. I am always extra aware of my surroundings, especially at night, and I don't look at my phone while I walk home either. I don't think that I'll ever get the image of his blank stare as he lunged towards me out of my head and... I'll never forget the feeling of the pit of my stomach as I realized that he followed me home, watching me and touching himself like that, and was now waiting to strike. It was like being a deer realizing that it's being stalked by a tiger, because the tiger accidentally stepped on a twig and gave itself away right before it pounced on its prey. I was extremely lucky that night. So I feel like now that I'm 23 years old, male, and that I've grown up a bit, I'm starting to feel the gravity of many things that happened, and have happened around me even. Being a curious person, I like to investigate things, I like to make my own theories around them, and yesterday morning I started having this conversation with my mum about my theories on what dreams actually are and what science says about it. In the midst of that conversation, I suddenly recalled an incident that happened with her many years ago. My mum is not at all a, a person who likes to make things up. She's always really skeptical of superstitions and all that. And I know that if she claims that watching something with her own eyes, which freaked her out and almost froze her to death, that she is probably speaking the truth. It happened around 12 years ago. My family was going through financial crisis and we used to live in my maternal grandma's house back then. Recently, a thief had been sighted in the house who ran away in panic because of the fear of being caught. Many scary things were happening and we took them all seriously because they were causing all of our family a lot of stress. I didn't get to know exactly when and how, but one evening my mum told my grandma that she saw what she described as a hairy demon in the bathroom and almost froze to death seeing it. As I was a stupid 11 year old kid back then, I took it as a fun horror story and I just let it be. But when I recalled this incident yesterday, I decided to ask about the details with my mum. So I asked her to explain what the appearance of that thing was like. She told me that apparently it was sitting on the floor of our bathroom. She said that it looked like an early man was her words told me that it was so gigantic that when it stood up on its legs, he easily reached the ceiling. As she froze and started screaming for help from my dad, this creature took only a couple of really, really long strides and disappeared. But the strangest thing is that she says that she doesn't actually recall many of the details about how this thing actually disappeared. It's almost like she has a memory gap. 
I asked her why she calls this thing a demon and she said that because that's what her first guess was. I asked, so you mean to say that it looked like a caveman? She said, no, it wasn't a man or a human in the first place. A beast? I asked. In fact, she said that it had very long hair all over its body and the hair had a, a sort of soil-like color to it. And it was at this point, immediately my brain, for whatever reason, said, Bigfoot? Then I googled Bigfoot and showed her the images, and she said that it was very much of the same appearance as those images. To be honest, I really didn't know what to make of that. I was shocked to hear it. The thing is, too, is that I'm from India of all places. Nobody ever heard of any Bigfoot in India, let alone in an urban environment, and that too in one's bathroom of all places. As weird and illogical as this incident sounds, apparently my mum swears by it that it really happened. Again, my mum rarely believes in things like this and is always very serious towards stuff like this, so she's never really been attention-seeking or something like that. And this incident never helped her in any way either, so I can't really think of a reason why she would lie about it. In fact, she was facing so many more challenges in life that this incident was a fresh wound on already wounded skin, to be honest. But, I don't know, what do you guys think about this incident? How can one see a Bigfoot-like creature in one's own home, which then just disappears and is never seen again? Could it have been something else? Also, there's a little incident about how my grandma saw it too around the same time, which I'm not including here, but I don't want to make this super long and all that. But that obviously lends credence to my mum's story too. Anyway, thanks for listening, and if you've got any thoughts to share, then I would love to hear it. So my childhood best friend, Mary, and I were around 11 or 12 years old at the time. Mary's family had their own campsite in a provincial park, about two hours from our own hometown, and would spend the entire summer each year living in their camper out there. This particular summer, I was able to go and stay with them for a week, and we were pretty excited to spend our time adventuring throughout the forest. On the last night that I was there... We decided that we wanted to hurry down to the ice cream shop by the lake before it closed. It was early evening at this point, still pretty bright out but beginning to lose light. The path that we took was down a short slope right next to the main road with maybe 10 feet of thick brush and trees in between. On the other side was the forest and with more tall thick brush. So we were walking along, well, we didn't see a single other person on the path in front or behind us, but we hear a, a sudden rustling and snapping of branches, similar to the sound of maybe a deer moving through the woods. Quite honestly, I, I wouldn't have thought anything of it, but then the sound of running footsteps follows. Mary glances back and suddenly grabs my arm, urging me under her breath not to look back. At the same time, the running stops. I don't know why I didn't ignore her and get a good look myself, but I guess I could sense the, the very real fear in her voice and... I chose to listen. We both start to panic though, getting that feeling like when you're running up the stairs after turning the basement light off. Well, we pick up speed as much as we can without breaking into a sprint, knowing that the ice cream shop is only about a minute walk away at this point. The path soon breaks and we're in the parking lot. Suddenly, Mary steers me hard to the left, heading towards the lake in the boat rental instead of continuing straight to the ice cream shop. And I go along with it silently, understanding ice cream is no longer an interest right now. Mary is clearly panicking at this point. We're both looking around, but it seems like whatever scared her is nowhere in sight at this point. Mary walks up to the boat rental and gets us a kayak, and we climb in and begin to paddle out into the middle of the lake. As we paddle, she tells me that apparently there was a man behind us and that the man had stopped running at us very abruptly upon making eye contact with her. He had been wearing a, a long black coat with the hood up, despite it being the middle of July, had a terrible smirk on his face, and she swore that as he stopped running, she saw him put something shiny away in his coat. He appeared to have just emerged out of the bushes after we walked past, 
And given the sounds that we heard right before he came running on the path too, I am pretty sure that she was telling the truth. We reached the center of the lake though and stopped paddling. I pull out my Nokia brick phone that my parents had, thank God, given me, just in case, and I hand it to Mary and tell her to call her parents to come and pick us up. As the phone rings, I see her look out past me to the shore and go pale, then lifting a hand to point out what she was seeing. I turn and there was the man, stalking his way around the path that circled the edge of the lake, staring out at us. We sat in the middle of the lake and watched him do two full laps, never looking away from us, before finally disappearing. It took a few tries to get a hold of her family. We were just freaking out so bad the whole time, as the sun got lower and lower as well. But eventually, we did manage to have someone come with the truck. But by that time we reached the shore, it was pretty dark outside. And to be honest, I really don't know what we would have done if we hadn't have been able to call for a ride that day. Looking back, I don't know why we didn't just go to the ice cream shop in the end, inform an adult there and ask her parents to come and get us. But whatever the case, it worked out for the best in the end and we got back safe. And thankfully, we never saw that man again. So about 12 years ago, I was 9 years old and I was home alone with my 12 year old brother. We were supposed to go to my aunt's house to have lunch and wait for my mother there. We always did that because we were too young to stay home alone according to my mum. So we got up at 10.30am, I took a shower and my brother. After that we were both in the bathroom brushing our teeth and finishing up when we heard someone knocking on our door. Since every time someone knocked at our door, they turned out to be a salesman or probably a Jehovah's Witness, we kind of waited for them to just go away. And after a couple of minutes, I went to see if they were still outside through the window, but nobody was there, which was a huge relief for us. We continued getting ready when we saw a shadow go by through the bathroom window, which was kind of like a small square made with that kind of glass that makes everything behind it really blurry. We waited and saw in case it was just a bird flying by, but then a hand hit it, clear as day. We got scared, we really didn't know what to do. My brother had his cell phone, so he immediately called the police though. And while it was ringing, we heard a loud bang at the door. Someone was brute forcing it. I don't know if they were kicking it or ramming it or what, but it was one of the most frightening things that I had ever heard. My brother told me to lock the bathroom door, so I did. It took five bangs before the perpetrator finally bashed open the door. Then the police answered and I remember the exact thing my brother said. He was whispering, his voice could barely be heard, but he said, Hello, there's someone in our house and I think they're stealing. Then there was a pause. We're at, meant he gave our address. There was another pause. I'm with my little brother locked in our bathroom, please hurry. While all that was happening, I was sitting against the wall hugging my knees and it was one of the most nerve-wracking experiences ever. I could hear this man going through all of our stuff, emptying stands, going up and down the stairs, opening cabinets. He even broke a few cups and plates, don't know why. Then I heard the sound my cell phone does when it turns off and I remembered leaving it on the kitchen table. I felt so stupid for leaving it there to be honest but... Things continued for a couple of minutes when we heard him trying to open the door to the bathroom. My brother got a hold of a big metal rod that we had lying around there. He started kicking the door. Who's there? The man screamed and we didn't say anything. There was another kick, then another one. I felt like I was about to have an anxiety attack. My chest started to ache and I had chills and was really hot. I tried to remain calm but it was just too much. After that though, he stopped, we heard the door opening and then there was silence. We waited for almost 10 minutes before going out of the bathroom and the living room was just a total mess. Lots of papers and books on the floor, the cabinets were open, cups and plates on the floor. In our mother's bedroom, the nightstand and the closet were open and everything inside them was all over the place. Upstairs in our room, it was the same thing. 
In about five minutes, the man was able to go through everything that we had and left a, a total mess. After that, my brother called my mum and she ordered us to go to my aunt's ASAP, so we did. When we got there, I was a little bit more relaxed. My aunt was waiting for us with ice cream, probably because my mum told her everything and she wanted to calm us down a bit. We went back home at about 5 o'clock in the afternoon and my mum told her boss that she had a, a home emergency so she left early. She tidied up the house, cleaned up and left everything the way that it was before so that we could relax. I really appreciated her effort and my aunt's too to calm us down and do everything so that we didn't have to think about it. According to my mum, the police got home after she arrived at 3 o'clock, four hours after the incident, mind you. She explained everything, but because of a lack of evidence, nothing could really be done. The man was never caught, and honestly, I, I don't even think they even tried to search for him. The next few days, though, my mum was home with us, and yeah, I tell the story these days as a, a bit of a funny anecdote, I guess. Luckily, no one was hurt, and he only took use of stuff in the end, but at the time, I was really scared. To be a nine-year-old and have an experience like that can have really serious repercussions. I'm lucky it never came to that, and I got over that after a couple of weeks, but yeah, it's something that I'll never forget. That much is for sure. This takes place back in early 2017. I had recently moved from a major city to a small town in the Midwest to get myself together and separate myself from bad habits that I had developed. Previously, I'd been living on the West Coast and worked for a couple who were pot farmers, just trimming their weed for one season with a, a few other trimmers. Nothing major stuck out to me other than the guy, mid-30s, was a total jerk and super protective of his weed. And his girlfriend was someone that I wouldn't normally get along with, but she was okay. In any case, I trimmed their weed that season and they paid me a portion up front. They, or he I should say, said the rest would come after he sold a few pounds of whatever, because that was just how the business went. They did end up paying me within a few weeks, so all was good with me in the end. However... The man here kept texting me after I moved mid-country with random hey how are you doings sort of thing. I never liked the guy, got bad vibes from the get-go and his wife or girlfriend was a friend of a close friend so I sort of gave them the benefit of the doubt I guess. Anyway, the wife or girlfriend started messaging me via text nearing spring after I'd worked for them trimming weed that fall season asking if I would be available to house it for them while they were on vacation out of the country. At this point, I was living in Colorado and the farm was in California. I didn't have a permanent job set up yet and they were offering good money to house it plus some extra money trimming weed that they had left over from the season. Stupidly, I drove my butt 17 hours with dollar signs in my eyes and all the hell that was from there. I would like to share a lot of details, but the gist of it is that someone was at their house the entire time that I was house-sitting. I'll try and set up the scenario for you as best as I can, but they have a, a full house with a gardener's quarters attached to their main house. There's a one-bedroom and a bathroom, an electric stove, kettle or kitchen area in the gardener's bedroom. There's also a doorway from this area into the main house, blocked by a bookshelf on my side. When they invited me to stay and house it, they were there for two to three days and part of their stay included drilling the door shut on the opposite side so that I could not enter their house. To be honest, that did not bother me and I honestly understood why they block up their house like that, but things got really weird afterwards. So, I'd been there alone for a few days, just trimming weed, walking the dogs, filling the hummingbird feeders, watching the house like I was supposed to. Honestly, this house was out in the middle of nowhere anyway, so I don't even think anyone would have come there anyway. But the girlfriend or wife would call from Morocco every so often to check up on me. I thought that everything was fine, to be honest. Until I started to hear water running from the kitchen inside of the house. The part of the house that I had no access to, but was directly connected to. I immediately called the couple, or texted them, maybe, and... 
told them that I could hear someone in their house. Their response was literally, it's none of your concern what you hear on the other side of the wall. This really turned my stomach. I was in the middle of nowhere, locked by a gate on their property, hired to house it, and all of a sudden it was not my concern if someone was inside of their house. It freaked me out, and I still had two more weeks to be at this place, but without phone service too, and I was properly freaked out at this point. Over the next few days though, I would feel scared and calm in waves. At one point, I was sitting outside with the dogs and they all ran up to the side of the house wagging their tails like they were greeting someone and I heard a very quiet shush and footsteps patter off. I continued to hear the TV and microwave water running from the main part of the house. The language the girl or wife was using with me via text was too personal in regard to what I was doing. I mean, sure, they could have had a camera installed although I scorched the room for any devices, but the sounds and even the dogs reacting to what I heard was enough for me. Once I realized that I was house-sitting, but also being spied on in some weird way, I started to have some fun with it. I don't know if I figured that I was going to die anyway, or that if maybe I acted crazy enough, they wouldn't want me for whatever their purposes were, but one night... I was out in the small porch, steps, having a very late cigarette. It had to be 11 to midnight and I could hear someone walking around the perimeter of the house. So I stood up, opened the door to the gardener's quarters and closed the door as if I had walked back inside, but I just opened the door and closed it to give that impression, keeping my position with the cigarette on the porch that is. Immediately, someone walked from the side of the house because they thought that I went inside noticed me, and then ran into the woods. In my mind, I set up a tiny trap to see if I was just delusional and it proved that I wasn't. So I started doing crazy, dumb stuff because I was alone. Nothing too wild. I just blasted Backstreet Boys, set up their garage cans like a drum set, and walked around topless. Honestly, I thought that if these people were crazy enough to watch me while I house sat for them, I had to do something more ridiculous to push them away. Maybe that doesn't make sense to you, but I can't help but reference the Hey Arnold episode where a bully is after him and he says, Don't hit me. I'll hit me. I'm crazy. Anyway, the couple finally came back to their house from Morocco and acted like they didn't want to pay me. They did after some pulling and tugging, but man... Don't ever go house-sit and not really know the people you're house-sitting for in the Emerald Triangle like I did. Or just don't even go there at all as it's genuinely a, a really shady business. So when I was in high school, my friends and I were into really spooky stuff that we honestly had no business messing around with. We would visit cemeteries at night, go to our small town's local haunt spots to try and stir up any urban legends. But the story that I'm about to tell made us pretty much quit cold turkey trying to seek out the paranormal. So one night, we were over at our friend's century-old home, and I mean, it was old and creaky and the perfect setting for a night of Ouija board. But we brought it out, and for the first half hour, nothing insane happened. Just some basic movement from the planchette. Then, feeling smug, I asked the spirits what my middle name was. The thing is, my middle name is literally made up by my parents. It's not a real name. No one in the circle knew, let alone could spell my middle name. There was literally no way that someone could even guess it. But somehow, the board knew. It spelt my middle name perfectly, and I could feel my heart fall into my gut at that point. Keep in mind, my hands were not on the planchette, so I couldn't have actually moved it myself either. Everyone laughed because what a silly middle name that would be, but I had to confess that it was mine. And the color drained from everybody's faces immediately. Then, all of a sudden, a glass ashtray that was sitting a few feet away on the coffee table split clean in two. And at that, we were done. We left the house to go stay somewhere else, unfortunately, I've never experienced anything that terrifying ever again. So 
So I lived in a house where what I can only describe as unexplainable things occurred. It was a double and I rented the bottom and my sister and my newborn nephew, they lived in the unit on the top. Crazy and unexplained things just kept happening too. For example, one time I was knocking on my sister's door and no one would answer. The door was locked and I figured that she was in the back bedroom and just couldn't hear me. So I knocked louder and finally I could hear someone walking down the stairs to unlock the door to let me in. Only when I opened the door, there's nobody in there. I go upstairs and find my sister and nephew asleep. When I wake up my sister, she has no clue what I'm talking about and no clue who let me in, but she tells me that somehow her son keeps getting out of this very large crib without a scratch on him or even a bump or a sound. It was just completely impossible for a newborn to get out of his crib, but it happened again when I was babysitting. It still scares me to think about it because it was just impossible to escape a crib like this and... If he somehow could climb out, he would be hurt really badly too. I went to check on him and he was sitting in the floor completely fine, just chilling like he wasn't alone. Stuff like this kept happening too and then one day, somebody shows up while we're standing on the porch and they tell us their name and ask if their W-2s had been sent there. Apparently they were the previous tenants. We did find the mail that he was looking for too, proving that he was who he said that he was. He refused to step on the property though and told us that we need to be out of that house as soon as possible. He told us that his mum lost her mind from living in that house and will never be the same. After everything we'd experienced, how could we not believe him too? We were a month to month lease and after that we got out as soon as we could. I like to think of myself as a, a rational and logical person and just have never been able to explain to myself what the heck was going on in that house. So I've been debating about whether to share this or not, but I finally decided that it's been long enough for me to talk about this. It all happened to me and my mum a few months ago, back in October. It happened in a very rural part of New Hampshire, like a, a side road on a, a side road type of neighbourhood. It was pouring out as it had been raining for pretty much the whole day. My mum had just gotten back from down the street in my sister's car and I was on the couch in the living room when suddenly I heard the doorbell ring. Our front door has a huge glass pane in the front so we can look out from the inside and someone can look in from the outside too. And through this window pane, I see a man. I didn't get a great look at him as I didn't have my long distance glasses on. But the man noticed that I had seen him and waved as if he was trying to be friendly. For the rest of this too, I'll refer to this guy as Poncho Man. So I got up and thought about opening the door for Poncho Man, but relented. As I couldn't properly see who it was, I didn't want to let a stranger in the house, obviously. So instead, I went down the hall to my parents' bedroom where my mum was getting ready for work. She asked what was up, and I explained to her that a man in a poncho was outside of our door and wanted to talk to us. She went as white as a ghost. Immediately, she stopped getting ready, closed and locked the bedroom door, and started checking the windows to make sure that they were locked. I asked her what was going on, and my mum explained that she was driving home, she had seen the poncho man, and he'd been standing motionless on the side of the main road. And as soon as my mum turned down the road, he started to walk, presumably to follow her. She said that the encounter, while being weird, she didn't think too much of it. But why would someone be out there in the pouring rain, down a back road in the afternoon of all things. It was like he was waiting for something. Hearing this, I started to panic a bit as well. My mum called my aunt, the two are like best friends, and asked what she should do. My aunt told her to call the police immediately and so we did. We proceeded to pace around the bedroom frantically looking out the windows to see if we could see Poncho Man. From where the bedroom was angled, it was impossible to look at the front porch and see if he was still there, but we were desperate for anything. 
After what felt like hours, we finally saw a police car pull up. We carefully unlocked the door and went down to let the officer in. We explained what we saw and he agreed to do a scan around the neighborhood. As he left, I noticed that there was something on the doorknob though. I took it off and it was a, a political ad for a candidate that was running for office. It's possible that Poncho Man was just campaigning for the candidate, but there are a lot of holes in that story. Like, it was pouring out, so why would you go door to door in pouring rain? And why would you go that route in such a rural neighborhood? That the houses are so far apart that you could barely make a dent on foot. The time doesn't make sense either. I mean, sure, I and my mum were home, but it was about four in the afternoon. Most people would still be at work, so you'd probably get no response from knocking anyway. Eventually, too, the officer returned and he had found the guy down the road and had questioned him. Poncho Man was able to ID himself and he claimed that he was a political campaigner and was just knocking on doors for that reason. But when probed further, conveniently enough, Poncho Man couldn't provide any other door signs, as the one that he had left on our house was the last one apparently. That makes the campaign story even more absurd. I mean, our house is in the middle of the street. It's not like we were the last by any means, so why wouldn't you bring enough for the whole street? Even the officer pointed this out to us and said that it was definitely unusual behavior. Although the officer was suspicious of him, there wasn't really anything that he could do about it, as there was no way to prove intent. He told us, though, to be alert and not to hesitate to call if Poncho Man returns. Anyway, fast forward a few weeks and I start noticing that a police car seems to be permanently stationed down the road from us about a three minute drive. I got curious one day and asked my mum about it and she said that there were multiple break-ins into the houses down the road apparently and the police were doing a sort of sting operation. The Poncho Man encounter and the break-ins may be unrelated but... Considering how Poncho Man acted, I have a sinking feeling that somehow they're all connected. Thankfully, for the past few months, we've heard and seen nothing of Poncho Man. We eventually got a new doorbell system with a camera and the police left the area where they were doing the sting and I hope that this whole situation is over and done with and that I never have to meet Poncho Man ever again. This happened roughly eight years ago now. I was hanging out with some friends for one of our friend's birthdays. We had gone out for a stroll to our local dock to wait for our wee guy. We were all 16 or 17. This is important too because we were not under the influence at this time. When we arrived at the dock, we hung out for a bit talking and waiting for our weed guy. My buddy gets a text from him saying to meet him in a different spot because he was held up at another place. The rest of my friends agreed to walk there, whereas I was an overweight kid and kind of lazy at the time. I didn't want to walk the mile and a half to pick up the smoke, and so I elected to stay at the docks because they planned on returning to smoke by the lake anyway. Fast forward about 10 minutes after they left, and I'm sitting on a bench looking out over the water when I look to the right, down the length of the lake, and see a white orb floating maybe 150 feet over the lake. I immediately got this... I don't know, gut feeling of being extremely uncomfortable looking at this white orb and began to walk back to where my friends were supposed to go. I made it to the train tracks that headed out of the dock area when I heard, hey, and my name. I turned around to see four figures that I couldn't quite make out, walking out behind one of the boats on the shore, waving. This was how many of my friends were with me before they left too. But anyway... The next thing that I know, I'm completely turned around from the direction that I was heading out of the dock area. I hear sounds coming from the fence line to my right, which is my friends yelling my name and asking where I was. Not to mention that between the time of seeing the figures walk out from behind the boat to hearing my friends, about 40 minutes had passed and to this day, I don't know what happened to that time that I lost. I would love to hear your thoughts and... If you have any idea of what might have happened.
Back in 2013, I just started an education journey and after the first school period, I had to be out and find an internship to be able to progress. But at the time, it proved to be almost impossible to get one, so while I was looking, I decided to take another job just to make sure that we had food on the table. After searching for a while, I found out that a friend of my fiancé's family had his own handicap bus company, a kind of taxi service for wheelchair users or otherwise disabled people, and he needed someone to cover the night shift since it was a bus that had to be on call at least 22 hours a day. And seeing that I'm quite the night owl, I immediately told him that I'd be happy to take the job and after I got the needed license, I was hired. The job was pretty basic. I mean, pick people up and drop them off where they needed to go and sometimes use a machine to get wheelchairs up or down from stairs and when there was no trips, I drove to a designated area and did whatever I wanted while waiting. I quickly found a truck stop in the area too where I could park and catch some Z's while waiting. There was a gas station where I could buy coffee in the early hours of the shift and on the other side of the gas station's parking lot on the opposite side of the truck stop, there was a rundown restaurant with a motel connected to it. To not disturb the sleeping truckers if I got a trip in the middle of the night, I usually parked on the restaurant side. So after parking there every night for a while, I noticed one particular room had a, a lot of people come and go in and in the beginning I thought nothing of it. But then one night, in the end of the summer, while I was half asleep with the window slightly open, I suddenly heard yelling coming from the motel and a dude came tumbling out of the room and started running. And a few seconds later, a big dude came running after him with something in his hand. I couldn't make out what it was, but I thought that it was none of my business and went back to my half-sleeping waiting stage. Not much time passed and my phone went off and I had a trip an hour's drive away so I turned on the bus and was leaving the parking lot when I saw the big guy coming around the corner. The rest of the night I had back to back trips so I didn't park until I got home. The day after I didn't get a return to home zone until 2 or 3 in the morning. When I arrived at the parking lot, the area where I used to park had fist sized rocks strewn all over the place. Not connecting the dots at the time too, I just parked a few spots over and started waiting. I fell asleep pretty fast but was jerked back into reality when a car light in front of my bus honked its horn. They also then flashed the high beams and revved its engine. I thought it was just some idiot who noticed me sleeping and found it funny trying to make me scared so I jumped out of the bus about to tell him to get lost but instead of driving off or stopping... The driver made the start brake thing with the car, indicating that I was the one who should get lost. And then, that was the moment that I connected the dots. Not wanting to seem like a pushover though, I stood still and stared at the car. Not that I could actually see anything with the high beams, almost blinding me. And after what seemed like a really long time, but must not have been more than 30 seconds, the car drove off. After that... I decided to park near the trucks from then on in. So, a month or so passed and nothing had happened since the car episode and I figured that nothing more would if I just kept parking by the trucks. But then one night, I had a long 12 hour shift on a Sunday, 6pm to 6am, and I didn't have time to eat dinner before work that day and during the first half of my shift, I had back to back trips with no time to eat so... When I got a return to home zone, I quickly parked in the far end of the almost empty truck stop and got ready to eat my now very late dinner that my fiancé had packed for me. I wanted to watch some TV on my phone and while eating, so I sat on my back against the driver's side door and got comfy, but while turning my back to the door, I had accidentally hit the door lock with my elbow. And that was my luck. Because as I was sitting there scrolling Netflix on my phone... I suddenly felt the bus rock and heard the clack of the door handle behind me smack back in position. I quickly turned and saw a dude with a, a hood over his head quickly crouching and proceeding to lay down on the ground crawling under the bus with a huge kitchen knife in his right hand. I quickly got up and made sure the other two doors were locked and then I looked in all directions to see if I could spot him. He was still under the bus and... I was sure as heck not jumping out this time since the knife made his intentions pretty dang clear. 
Instead, I turned on the engine, turned on the spots on the back of the bus and looked around to see if I had scared him off and luckily for me, it seemed that it did. I saw him run off and into a bushy or woody area at the end of the truck stop and after that, I never parked at that truck stop ever again. I also always made sure that all the doors were locked every time that I was parked and trying to relax. So I went to the grocery store early one morning and when I was checking out, there was an elderly gentleman in front of me. He was wearing a veteran's hat. He started making casual conversation with me about prices and how, when he was young like me, the prices were super low. He was much older, so people around him, the cashier and some other gentlemen, helped him bag his groceries and whatnot, and he didn't have much, but it was hard for him to keep his balance. He almost fell at one point, held onto my arm and apologized to me for doing so. I told him that it was okay and to have a great day. I also didn't have many things, so I began to walk out of the store and eventually I caught up to him, as he couldn't walk very fast. So I asked him if he wanted me to walk him to his car and he told me that he had rode his bike because he was forced to turn his driver's license due to his age. I was impressed that he had rode his bike and asked him where he lived. He told me he lived about 15 minutes away, on bike that is. I asked him if he wanted a ride. He was elderly and didn't seem like a threat at all, and he accepted. So I popped my trunk open so that he could put his bike in. We were struggling when another man who was about to walk into the store saw and helped us. He thanked the elderly man for his service and proceeded to go inside. Now, on the way, he asked if we could stop by Carl's Jr. to get a new combo his wife saw on TV and had asked him to bring her back one. He called his wife and asked her what the name of the combos was. Once we got to the drive through we ordered and I offered to pay and he thanked me again. On the way to his house, he asked me what I do for a living. I told him that I'm paralegal and he asked for my number because he was trying to sue the state of California and a detective who was now retired. I gave him my number and then asked him about his potential case. He then proceeded to tell me that he had been in jail in the 70s for false rape allegations apparently and that the detective working on the case really had it out for him. I was shocked but working in the legal field it's not that uncommon for me to see these types of situations. When we got to his house his wife was waiting outside. She was also elderly and she thanked me for giving her husband a ride and seemed excited to have someone there. I had gotten out of the car and to get his bike out of my trunk so she asked me if she could show me their front yard leading all the way up to their backyard. She said that her and her husband worked on their home for many years and she seemed very proud of her home. I told them that I did have to leave but that it was nice to meet them and then she insisted. So in the end I let them show me around and when we got to the backyard they opened the back sliding door and asked if I wanted to come in for some orange juice. I kindly declined and I suddenly got a, a very weird feeling but I brushed it off. They told me that I could come in and set my purse down if I wanted. And my purse is a, a crossbody bag so I hadn't even realized that I still had it on. Anyway they insist for me to come in. Mind you, they're super elderly, so I did. They began to show me their wedding photos on the walls, and as we're walking through the home, the elderly man shows me all the doors, and the doors have all of these crazy type of contraptions, and he says, look, so nobody can break out. Well, mind you, he definitely said break out and not break in, and at this point, my gut was screaming at me to get out of there. He then said, come right this way, I want to show you how we converted this room. My fight or flight response kicked in at this point and I don't know how I figured it out but I was able to undo the contraptions from the front door and broke out of there. I ran to my car that was sitting in the driveway and I drove away as fast as I could. I went the opposite direction from where my house was but all I cared about was to get as far away as possible, fast. When I got home, I was shaken and I got several phone calls from him and voicemails asking why I had left so sudden and if I was okay. 
I blocked his number and called my cousin to tell her what had happened. And to this day, I don't know, was I almost kidnapped? I mean, they were extremely old, but maybe somebody else was in the house. Maybe someone much younger and stronger. Or maybe the whole thing was just an act. I don't know, but something about the whole situation just didn't feel right. Also, they told me at the time that they didn't have any children. But when I did some research online, I found out that they do have a daughter and a granddaughter who happens to be a local news reporter here in town. And the fact that they lied about that really only adds to all of my suspicions. About two years ago, a group of my friends went out to a concert. We had a good time, plenty to drink, and the concert had ended and we were just outside trying to figure out a, a place to cure our drunchies. We were standing in a circle on the sidewalk and our friend group consisted of seven guys and one girl. Now, some random guy comes up and stands way too close to the girl in our group. We didn't know what he was doing and it was really odd. All seven of us guys just stared at him like, what the heck are you doing? He noticed us staring at him and silently left at that point. Our friend Lexi had a disgusted look on her face and told us that he was standing so close that she could feel his boner on her leg. As he gets further up the street, we see him approach another woman who ignores him and keeps going her way. He then turns around and starts coming back to where we were and walks past us staring at our friend Lexi and we tell him to keep it moving, creep. About two minutes later, we hear a woman screaming and our whole group sprinting towards the screams. He's fully on top of a woman and there's a guy laying on the ground next to the woman screaming. My friend instantly jumps on his back and gets him in a headlock and starts pulling him off of the woman. I was fuming with anger and disgust and just started hitting on this guy in the face multiple times while my friend had him in a headlock. At this point, the guy is basically unconscious so we stop and we leave him lying there on the concrete. The guy who was laying on the concrete next to the woman being assaulted then all of a sudden wakes up, apparently he'd been knocked out or something, and comes over and kicks this guy. And apparently the creeper came up to this guy and the woman and started trying to touch the woman saying that he wants to, you know, have his way with her. And while the guy and the woman were boyfriend and girlfriend, so obviously the guy wasn't about to have this. But they were out celebrating his birthday and he was super drunk and unable to defend himself. The creeper punched the guy in the face and instantly knocked him out and had taken the woman to the ground and began assaulting her, which is when we showed up. Quite honestly, I'm just thankful that we were around at that point and showed up quickly as it could have been so much worse. I normally don't condone violence at all too, but sometimes it really is the only option. It was 1995. My family and I had moved into a new house in a fairly new suburb at the time. My parents thought of it as the perfect split-level house, spacious and family-friendly, even with an outdoor spa as well. They bought the house as second owners from a couple with three kids who were divorcing, and we were a pretty happy family. From the first day that we moved in, though, my parents complained about bees in a wall, they had a pest removalist come and exterminate the bees. Same night, my mum had a dream of a woman with long black hair looking like a gypsy with a red dress chasing her. She didn't think too much of it, obviously, as it was just a dream after all. I had a cousin come and stay with us from overseas a year later, and we recently found out that he told another family member after going back to his country about seeing a lady at ours and it was the same description that he gave as my mum saw in her dream. After that, weird things started happening too. My dad had troubles as his close-knit brothers and a sister who came to our house with their families almost every weekend turned on him without warning. His personality gradually changed too as he became arrogant and angry. He died young and suddenly at home in 2001 which forced us all to move house. Our front pergola caved in, I was having issues at school, my brother was always sick, and the birds in our aviary were dying one by one all the time, even after my dad had just bought them as young ones. 
I had even seen a faint spectre of a woman from my dining room upon coming home from school by the front door. I stared at it until it disappeared through the front door as soon as my dad came home from work. But the last night in our home, my mum dreamt of the same woman again saying goodbye. The weirdest thing though was that at our new house, there were no issues. We heard from our old neighbours though that our next door neighbour's granddaughter unfortunately took her own life on their property. Six degrees of separation, I eventually worked with a lady whose son married one of the three girls of the divorced couple who sold us that house. Her daughter-in-law's mother relayed information through her that confirmed my suspicions too. And I have since been doing some research via libraries and the local council for information as I'm still intrigued about this place to this day. So, it makes me question, what actually happened on that property or land before the house was built? Was there a murder that took place there or even the gypsy woman's body buried underneath the house or something? Was the gypsy woman's intent to ruin people's happiness? Did my dad get possessed by something? And of course, how are the owners who bought from us going with their own experiences there? If I find out that information, I'll be sure to let you guys know. Last night at around 5am, I was asleep and I heard a lot of the dogs in the neighborhood, including mine, barking. I tried to ignore them because, I mean, they do that sometimes. They bark for pretty much anything and everything. But a couple of seconds later, I think that I hear what sounds like people yelling, at least two different people. I'm obviously still half asleep, so at first I'm thinking that it's a bunch of teenagers just being rowdy and annoying. I mean, I used to do stuff like that too. But then I'm starting to understand what they're saying. It sounds more like they're arguing and I'm starting to wake up at this. I grab my phone and I call the police. I'm on the phone with the dispatch and hear what sounds like a woman screaming bloody murder. I've never heard anyone scream in such agony before too. But then I hear a man's voice scream as well and the dispatch tells me that other people have called the police so they're on their way. It honestly sounds like the people are right in my yard and my mum is awake at this point and comes to my room asking if I hear it too. Well, we finally get the courage to look out the window. It's just one woman. She's standing right under the streetlight near our yard and screaming. At points she makes her voice deeper and kind of sound like a man but it's just her. Her hair is tangled and she's wearing only shorts and a tank top in January. The police pull up about two minutes later and they're trying to pat her down but every time they go to pat her down she grabs at her pockets. Eventually they just arrest her and I know she probably just wasn't well or all there or perhaps even high but it was honestly scary to say the least. I've never seen someone acting like that and I've never heard someone in such agony like that before too. I don't know what was wrong with her or what happened to her after that. But I just cannot stop thinking about it. The way that she sounded, both as a man and as a woman, just didn't make sense to me. So let this be known before I start. We were kids and we had no idea about the paranormal at this time. However, my siblings and I had a Ouija board in our house. We had saw this trick that if you went into a dark small space with the Ouija board and a mirror, you could see the ghost that you were talking to apparently. Now, us being kids, I must have been eight at the time and we were excited to try it. So my brother, 14, my sister, 12, and my other sister, 11, and me all rushed to my brother's closet with a small flower mirror that we had. At first, we were just asking silly questions, normal kid stuff. Like, where are you? Who are you? What's your name? Etc. Me being the youngest, I was completely sure my older siblings were pulling a prank on me. I took my hands off and proceeded to accuse them of moving the planchette. My siblings then suggested that we all ask a question and then take our hands off to see if it moved. Being dumb kids, we asked, who do you want to kill? Well, we all took our hands off and the planchette shot towards my brother. All of us, being extremely freaked out, ran to my dad to tell him, to which he then made us smash the board with a sledgehammer outside. 
It was a, a scary experience, and we definitely didn't touch the glass. And there's just no explanation for how it moved like that. I mean, we were in a closet. There was no wind, there was no slant in the closet, and there was just nothing that could have made it move like that. So, does anyone know what this experience could have been? Although I'm super interested in the paranormal, I do not know a lot of information about it. This whole thing, though, has haunted me since I was a kid, and I'm glad that I finally get to share it here, and I would love to hear what you guys think. In 2020, I met this guy at a mall that I worked at. He owned one of the stores at the mall, and it was a tech store to repair phones. But I would see him often because the office was close to his store, to be specific actually, right across from each other. And one day he came up to me and asked for my name and we made small talk and we exchanged numbers. We started seeing each other until one night I was so tired from work that I didn't want to go to dinner with him anymore. I'm a single mum and I get burned out easily, so I told him that I didn't want to go anymore and he said, no, get ready, I already made the reservations. I said flat out that no, I wasn't going because I was exhausted and I'm the type to refuse to be forced into doing anything and being controlling is such a turn off so I was already getting ready to dump him. I said no firmly and he responded saying that I'm on my way and I said well, I'm not going so waste your gas if you want to. I didn't think that he would actually come but of course he did. He showed up at my apartment and was non-stop honking outside. He was calling and texting me non-stop while honking and I threatened to call the cops and he didn't stop. I called the cops for a noise complaint and as soon as he heard the sirens, he sped off. Now, I remember waking up the next morning to 60 text messages and 100 missed calls saying that I can't believe you stood me up. I love you and what is wrong with you. I just wanted to spend time with you. The list goes on, but it really made me see him in a different, weird, creepy light because how do you love me if we've only been dating for like two months? We weren't in a relationship at all, at least in my eyes we weren't. Yes, we did get it on already after the first two weeks of seeing each other, but what scared me was I remember when after we had done that, he said that he was a virgin. I'm starting to believe that he actually was too because of just how things started to escalate. But after he told me that, I didn't have intercourse with him again. So, out of the two months, we only had intercourse once. He's a Muslim and his parents are very strict and they're very on to him about whether or not he would sneak out to see me all the time, even though he was 24 at that moment. But after that night of him honking, I broke it off with him and called him a psycho. I told him that I don't ever want to see him again. So now, we're obviously in 2023, and ever since 2020 to now, he goes through weird mental states where, in certain months, he'll blow up my phone, but he'll do it once out of like six months basically, just out of the blue, and I never respond. Until one day in October, he sent an apology saying, I'm sorry, I've moved on, I know that I was acting crazy and blah blah blah, and that he wanted to be on good terms as friends, and asked if he can take me to dinner to make up for what he's done. I thought that he was being honest because I hadn't heard from him in months and I said okay so I went to dinner with him. But that was the biggest mistake of my life because before we got the food he literally got on his knees and begged for me to never leave him again and that he was in love with me. I've never been so scared or freaked out in my life and I just ate in silence to keep my cool and stood silent because I didn't know what he was capable of anymore and I didn't want him to like snap or something. Eventually though I said that I don't really feel good so can I go home and he drove me home. Once I got out of my car, I, once I got out of the car I was so relieved and promised myself that I would never talk to him again and I never did speak to him again. However, ever since October of 2022, he has been texting my phone once or twice a week asking to go to dinner and I've never responded because he honestly just makes me sick to my stomach. I moved, thank God, so he doesn't know where I live but 
Recently, he's been texting me to go to dinner again. The last text was December 30th, and the prior one was the week before that. And it's just been very consistent recently. But then, on Friday, January 6th, 2023, two days ago, he took a picture of me while I was working and sent me the picture saying, that's you. It scared me a lot because how the heck did he know where I worked? I mean, I just switched to a different salon and he didn't know the salon prior that I worked at. At least, I don't think he knew. I've only been at this salon for two or three weeks and it makes no sense and my heart dropped when I saw the picture and I responded, you're stalking me, leave me alone. And he said that he is a limo service and was driving around when no way in heck he could have seen me through the window because my station is the second station. He must have zoomed in to take the picture. There's a desk where he took the photo, so it's definitely really weird and creepy. I called the police and they basically victim blamed me and said, how do I know the guy that I dated and his last name or his home address and all that. They said, since I didn't know his last name or home address, I can't file a restraining order or order of protection. Honestly, I'm a bit lost as to what to do next and I would really like some help. I know that the laws are different in every state, but I'm in Chicago, Illinois, and I don't know what he's capable of, so please, if you know what I should do or have any advice, then I would really love to hear from you. So I'm an indigenous person, and I don't only believe in this stuff, but I've also had an encounter. I was driving about 12 miles deep on the dirt roads, County Road 5047 to be exact. The sun was setting, and I saw a dog, but the strangest thing is that it was running in circles. And then when I came up on it, it started to do zigzags and turned around and looked at me at one point, and... That was when I noticed that the tongue of all things was dramatically off. It didn't look like a dog tongue, it looked a lot like a, a human tongue. And that was when I started to feel a bit weird. I felt like death and I felt sick all of a sudden. So I sped past it and in my rearview mirror, the dog started chasing me. I must have sped up to 40 and it kept pace with me for some time, but... As I got away, not even five minutes later, a Navajo police car passed me heading in that direction. I always wondered what he must have seen or why he was going that way in the first place. Maybe he was just going home or maybe he got a report or something, but I just got out of there as quickly as I could because the whole situation felt very ominous. By the time the sun set, I was in Ute Mountain Nation and it got scary dark all of a sudden. Like, not your typical darkness, but it was absolutely black that night. I'm just glad that I got out of there before the dark fell and before whatever that thing was may have gotten any closer. So this is usually a story that I say for my partners, but it seems appropriate to share here. For those of you who aren't familiar, there's a big black market for car gas in Mexico. Cartels intercept tanks in the middle of the highways and steal them, and then resell them for cheaper and make a deal with the owners of the gas station so they can keep a profit without going through the legal company, essentially partnering with the cartel. About 10 years ago though, when I was 16, my dad owned a few gas stations. He has always been well connected and steers clear from any corruption. He goes as far as to avoid anyone involved in the drug business or who has any ties to it. And well, at the time, 10 or 11 years ago, my parents are divorced and I'm used to seeing my dad on a daily basis. He comes to my house and gets out of the passenger seat of his car and in the driver's seat was a, a shady, scary looking dude that was certainly not our driver. My dad and I go on a walk around the block and the shady dude starts following him. My dad tells him to stay put but... We're just taking a quick walk. I immediately ask my dad, who the heck is that and why is he following him? I'm not going to say that it was a smart move on my dad's part to tell me as I was filled with anxiety for months, but I was also glad to be aware of the situation. 
It turns out that the scary dude is a bodyguard that he'd hired. A cartel had approached him and asked if he wanted a deal on gas and they would split the profits. When my dad declined, they made it clear that it was not a question and that they'd be coming after him unless he changed his mind. Spoiler alert, he didn't. This meant that he couldn't go to the office. If he did, he had to take different routes and we had to meet in different places and he was always on the lookout for anyone who might be following him. I thought that I was going to cry hearing all of this to be honest. It's never fun to learn your family is in a life-threatening situation, in Mexico of all places, but remember how I mentioned that my dad is well-connected? Well, it turns out he knew someone deep inside the intelligence agency in the country, and they started an in-depth investigation into all of this. Three months later, and my dad had returned to pretty much normal life, as they had assessed the risk and dealt with it apparently, but he had to always remain aware and constantly change his route still. We're all safe and dandy now, and if my dad ever got another death threat, he chose not to make me aware of it. But man, those were some scary months to say the least. Like I said, I rarely tell this story because even thinking back on it causes me a lot of anxiety and fear. I'm really glad that my family always taught me to stay as far away as humanly possible to anyone involved in any sort of shady business. This happened on Saturday. I, a 29-year-old female, live in a decent neighborhood. Not the best, but definitely not usually thought of as super dangerous or anything. It wasn't even that late, to be honest, like 9.30pm, and it's summer in my country, so it's been dark for an hour or two at most. I had left my friend taking transport back home, and since my friend had left in a rush, there was something that I wanted to tell her that I felt that I would forget once I was home but I got my phone taken from my hands a few months ago, so I was waiting until I was in a, a safe place to take it out. So I turn a corner. There's literally one block to my house, and this is a pretty small street, mind you. I thought that I was safe, and suddenly someone talks to me. His words were slurred, so I didn't quite get what he said. It was dark too, but after a moment, I understood that he was telling me to give him my phone, or my wallet or something. I stared and despite the darkness, I saw something in his hand which he was holding very much like a gun. I think it may have been fake but still, it terrified me. For some reason I, I looked around and not so far away walking towards me was another woman. I screamed for help and ran away from the man, all the while bracing myself for the pain in case the gun wasn't fake. And then the woman yelled at me to stop running and to go inside of the building closest to us, and we did. There, after having a panic attack, the woman told me that the man had been next to a car that I didn't see because I was so fixated on the possible gun. Now, I doubt that the man wanted anything other than my phone, but still, the fact that he had a quick and easy escape and that there is a possibility that I could have lost more than just my cell phone... That scares me. I honestly thank God for that woman that day because without her, I don't know what would have happened. Back when I was in my late teens, I moved out of home, out of town, then rented a room from some couple. The woman didn't work, but her partner did, so she had a lot of time on her hands and she tried to control everything in the house, including me. I was working two jobs while studying at this point. The woman, who literally had no life besides from trying to mess up other people's lives, started doing weird stuff though. Examples of this were things like, I woke up to find her watching me sleep, she stole my sunglasses at one point, killed my fish, etc., she tried bossing me around and in real life trolling a bit, though she would disappear every full moon to apparently get nude and dance with her coven in the mountains. She claimed to be a witch and despite my interest in spirituality and tarot, I don't believe in witches or witchcraft. Anyway, I decided at this point that I'd had enough of tolerating her stuff and moved out. But that resulted in her stalking me via turning up to my workplaces and staring at me for hours. 
I reported her to the police and then she tried to cyberstalk me via Facebook and phoning me a million times. After moving into a new place, I would wake up in the night to see something standing in the corner of my room. Yet, whenever I got up or turned the light on, it always disappeared. Hence, I assumed I was dreaming. But eventually, it started standing at the foot of my bed. Again, whenever I tried to get up or turn on the light, it would always vanish though. But one night, I woke up to it standing there like usual. But this time... I could see a creepy woman's face on it and it was smiling at me. I said get lost and when I did, it vanished. For a while I didn't see anything but I started coming up with scratches all over my body. I had no idea where they had come from. I would find them on my arms, chest, hips and thighs. One night though I woke up and ran to the bathroom mirror because I thought something bit me to find scratches on my shoulder, back like someone had just clawed me. I checked my bed for anything that could scratch me and even visited a doctor who asked me if I was self-harming. I wasn't and couldn't figure out where these scratches were even coming from. The last incident though occurred one night when I was half asleep and rolled over to my side. I felt air on my face and originally I ignored it until I felt a big gust of air directly into my face. I opened my eyes to come face to face with this rotten, bloated, dead-looking woman. She looked wet like someone killed her and then left her in some water to rot or something. Her body was coming up out from underneath the bed while her head was propped up near my face. I actually screamed in horror and was too scared to get off the bed. I covered my face with the blanket and then started saying prayers and waiting until morning. Eventually the sun rose and I looked around the room but... There was nothing. After that, it never came back and the scratches, they seemed to heal. It scares me to think about, but I do wonder if it lived under my bed for a period of time or something and was scratching me from underneath. As to where it came from, again, I really don't believe in spells. Whatever it was, though, it wanted to pose as a female, I think, and... It was a part of my loser ex-housemate, like a malevolent manifestation of spite or something. And that's really all I can put it down to. Somehow, that woman, she managed to cause this. So this happened uh, a couple of days ago. I live in the suburbs of Northern California with my parents in an upper middle class neighborhood. My parents are away for their anniversary so I've had the place to myself for the week. I got home from a late shift at work at around 1am. I go inside, shower, then I head to the kitchen to make some buffalo wings for dinner. I crack open a beer and I sit in front of the TV for a bit. I was sifting through movies to watch an HBO Plus when all of a sudden the doorbell rings. It actually startled me to the point that I had jumped off the couch knocking my beer over in the process. It's now 2am and there was really no good reason for anyone to be at the door at this hour. I just sort of stared in the direction of the front door for several seconds before it rang again followed by rapid knocking on the door and the window. Now for whatever reason I was no longer scared but more annoyed at the fact that some idiot would think that it's appropriate to bang on someone's front door at this time of the night. I head over to the front door, unlock the deadbolt and pull the front door open leaving the chain in place. In the heat of the moment I didn't think to look out the window first, I just sort of yanked the door open. Standing on the front porch was a woman around mid-twenties with long silky black hair and a purple hoodie with black pants. I said, can I help you? To which she responded with, oh yeah, sorry to bother you so late but my boyfriend and I are having some car trouble and our phones are dead. But We were wondering if you could possibly let us use yours. She pointed up the street to what looked like a dark colored sedan parked underneath the street lamp and said, see that's us right there. Now, had this been any other person, and I would have said no, but she looked, I don't know, innocent. Like she was a college student. I live in a college town. And it wasn't completely uncommon for college kids to be out late on a Friday night. 
I asked her where her boyfriend was and she said that he walked to the gas station to see if anyone had a phone there. I pulled my iPhone out and told her to make it quick as I was about to go to bed. She thanked me and said that she'd only take two seconds. She took my phone, dialed a number and put the phone up to her ear. After a couple of rings, whoever she called picked up and she said, Uh, yeah, it's me. I'm borrowing someone's phone. She stopped talking and I could barely make out a man's voice on the other end. It was around this point too that I started to feel uneasy. She was taking a, a lot longer to be done with the phone call and I started to get impatient. The whole time she just stood there staring at me with a wide-eyed expression and a creepy smile that looked forced while this person on the other end kept talking. She finally said, Oh, okay, bye, and handed me my phone back. She then said, uh, Do you think that I might be able to come inside to use your bathroom? I said no and wished her good luck before shutting the front door. And right as I was about to walk away, I began to hear her laugh and say, you made the right choice. I looked out the peephole and she was still standing on my porch, but now she had a man standing next to her. He looked to be around her age and was wearing a, a hoodie and also a face mask. The pair then started to circle around my house, banging on the windows and laughing. I didn't hesitate to call 911 at this point, but they stuck around for several minutes trying to get in through my back door. I had my Glock 19 in hand aimed at the back door with 911 on speaker and was prepared to do whatever I had to do if they got in. They banged on my back door for around five minutes before they finally left. I watched them run up the street to that black sedan that I mentioned earlier and take off up the street. The cops showed up a few minutes later and they took a report. They told me that I was the third person to call them that night reporting a suspicious couple attempting to enter homes. I don't know what they had planned, but I'm inclined to believe that it was nothing good. Moral of the story is never answer the front door at 2am, especially without looking to see who it is first. I definitely learned my lesson that night. When I turned 18, me and my two other friends decided to take a trip to our local casino. We mostly just played simple games like slots and video roulette since it was our first time going to the casino. After losing some money, we decided to search for something to eat. Pretty much everything was way too overpriced, so we wandered around for quite a bit. Eventually, we reached a hallway along the border of the main floor. We made our way down the hall looking for food, but everything was closed. We started to notice that the hall was completely vacant of people though. As we wandered further down the hall, we reached a sort of oddly intriguing small room through a double doorway. This was the only entrance into this room. It was completely empty except for us three and about 10 to 20 slot machines, I would guess. But we were bored though, so I decided to throw five bucks into the slot machine and spin a few times. After my second or third spin, an odd-looking man, early to mid-thirties, just appeared from behind the slot machine, seemingly out of thin air. He began watching me play and started getting uncomfortably close to us. We weren't very worried since we outnumbered him like three dudes to one. However, we were very confused. We grew more and more uneasy the longer that we stood there, not saying a word. Eventually, my friend decided to ask him what's up. The man looked at us for a second before asking if we were all brothers. None of us looked even remotely similar, so we told him that we were just friends. He said, oh, uh, that's great, and proceeded to ask if he could join our group. We told him that we all came together and lied in saying that we were actually planning on leaving soon. He told us that we should stay and play with him and says, my good friend Rachel over there knows all the good machines and points to the other side of the room. We sort of slowly peer around the machine and all immediately become horrified. There was nobody else in the room with us. He was pointing into an empty corner. We all sort of 
stand up from our seats and slowly back out of the room, not letting our eyes leave this guy. Once he was out of sight, we turned around and sprinted down the hallway back to the main game room. We all vowed to never go back down that hallway ever again, and I never did. But curiosity eventually got the better of us. Now, about a year and too many casino trips later, we're playing blackjack back at the same casino with a fourth friend. He gets bored and hungry and says that we should go look for some food. After walking around looking for food, we made it back to the entrance of that very hallway that we vowed never to return to. The fourth friend said that we should search down there for some food. The rest of us tell him no and explain to him that we can't go back down there. He asks why, so we tell him about the experience down that hallway one year prior. He believed that we were making it up and that there was no room or slot machines in the location that we described. He explains that mum was a worker at the casino and he would know if there was a rogue room of slots in the middle of nowhere. So we did the one thing that we could do to convince him of our experience. We decided to lead him to the room. We made our way down the hallway and searched for the room, but... After walking for a few minutes, we reached the end of the hall. Confused, we turned around and searched again, thinking that we had somehow missed it, but no, there was no room. We came to the conclusion that they must have moved the machines out of the room, since the casino changes things around quite frequently, so people don't gain a sense of direction on the game floor. So we once again walked down the hallway in search of an empty room, or at least a set of closed doors that would enter the room. But there was nothing. No doors even remotely close to where we remembered the room. We were completely dumbfounded and started to question our sanity after all this. But all three of us remembered the room in the same location, yet there was nothing. There was no room with slot machines. In fact, there was no room at all. To this day, neither me nor my friends understand or can explain how any of this happened. A couple of years ago, my buddy and I were bored one afternoon and we decided to explore an abandoned house that I had spotted earlier that week when I was out on a drive. We live in a town that is mostly suburbs, but if you drive like five minutes north, it's all country roads, farmland, forest, etc. The abandoned house that I spotted was in the middle of a field. There wasn't a paved road or gravel driveway that led up to it, so we parked as close as we could on the side of the road and walked through the tall grass to reach it. But the house looked pretty old, most likely built in the early 1900s. There were plants engulfing the entire home and part of the roof was missing from what looked like fire damage. It had obviously been abandoned for quite some time, but my friend told me that it was going to hang back when we came close to the house. He just couldn't shake the feeling that something was off and said that he was getting bad vibes from the place. I decided to keep going and when I reached the house I looked in through the windows and saw lots of weather damage and signs of neglect. The door, however, was still locked. I walked around the perimeter of the house and found a cellar door. It was unlocked. I entered and slowly started walking down an old wooden staircase. I got about halfway down, I think, and squinted, waiting for my eyes to adjust to the darkness. The only light source was the sunlight coming in from the open cellar door. It was full of old belongings, furniture, and junk. But then... In the far right corner of the room, I saw what looked like a figure standing in the darkness facing me. My stomach sank when I saw the person. Whoever they were, they were tall and they were just standing there straight with their arms at their side. I couldn't make out what they were wearing or any facial features, but I stood there for a few seconds staring back at them in shock. I thought that it had to be my mind playing tricks on me, so... I sort of squinted harder trying to make out if what I was seeing was actually a tall figure. When suddenly, it moved slightly and made a, a deep grunting sound. I panicked and I ran up the stairs as fast as I could. When my friend saw the look on my face when I exited the basement, he started running towards the car. He said that it looked like I had seen a ghost and 
When we drove away, I kept looking back to see if we were being followed, but thankfully, there was nobody there. This is the story my aunt told me years ago. My aunt and her family lived in a very rural and backwoods area of Lincoln County, West Virginia. She said that her father would go fox hunting periodically. He and the other men would travel up into the mountains to their camp. There they would let their dogs run, chase foxes, and spend the evening talking and telling stories among themselves. My aunt had many siblings, which was not uncommon back in the 1950s, backwoods West Virginia. Her mother decided that she would walk with several of the younger children up to her husband's, my aunt's father's, camp. My aunt was one of the party and she said that they walked a long way back up on the mountain and spent a few hours relaxing and spending time with her dad. The group had such a nice time that they didn't realize it had gotten so late. My aunt's father gave his wife a lantern in order for her and the kids to be able to see on their long journey down the mountain. As the group left, the light from the fox hunters camp eventually faded out of sight. As they walked on down the mountain, her mother noticed a small ball of light about the size of a, a softball coming down the mountain behind them. Thinking that it was her husband needing something, she and the children stopped on the trail to wait. As they stood there, the light slowly made its way down the path and into better view. My aunt said though that the closer that it got, they could see that it wasn't actually a lantern at all, but a ball of light floating about three feet from the ground. She said that once her mother realized this, she put the children in front of her and told them to run as fast as they could down the old trail that was cut into the mountain. My aunt told me that they all ran as fast as they could down the hill. She said that the faster they ran, the faster the ball of light moved. My aunt said that they finally got to where their home was and ran inside and locked the door. According to my aunt, they were all terrified, and when they finally got the courage to look out the window, there was nothing there. So, I've never really had a paranormal experience, which is why I've always erred on the side of skepticism, I think. But I just started to dog sit regularly, overnight stays, and have stayed in three homes so far with no issue. I don't ever get scared on my own at night, and especially not when I have dogs with me. I also never have problems getting to sleep and staying asleep, even in places that are new to me. However, this day, I don't know, it was different from the jump. Typically, I get like 8 to 10 hours, but the first night, I got maybe at most 4 so far, I've always slept on the couch with a dim light on nearby, so I don't run into stuff if I have to use the bathroom in the middle of the night. I settle in at around 9pm this night because the dog that I'm sitting is a puppy and the owner told me that that's when he gets sleepy. I put my headphones in and settle in to watch a few episodes of Misfits until I'm tired enough to turn in. The dog lays down to sleep on my legs. Everything is typical of every house sitting that I've ever had so far. The only thing that I'm not used to though is this house has a, a walkway on the second floor looking down into the room that I'm sleeping in. I'm fine though. Like I said, I, I don't really get scared. So I go to sleep at around midnight. The issues this night arose though when the dog woke me several times, barking at nothing. Each time this would happen too, I would settle him again, blame it on him sleeping in a different area and not being used to it then go back to sleep. It took longer each time, but I did it. Only, it got to the point that every time that I was on the cusp of sleeping, he'd bark or start growling. Finally though, I managed to fall asleep at around 3.30, only to wake up at 6.30 to the sound of voices talking, sounding like they were in the kitchen, the room over. My initial thought was it was the owners using the furbo, like a baby monitor but for dogs that's in there with the crate because it sounded like it came from the same area but that didn't make sense though because the dog was with me and it was 6 30 in the morning so i called it an auditory hallucination from lack of sleep and i just moved on 
Now, he's a pretty big puppy, a Vizsla, 45 pounds at 6 months, so I'm thinking maybe he needs more space on the couch. I switched to the pullout on the second night. I also put the lights that I dimmed in the kitchen to the max, but it was the same. I go to sleep at 12.30, more on edge today, start clocking noises that I wasn't paying attention to yesterday, but sometimes it sounds like shuffling on the carpet on the second floor. Sometimes it's taps coming from the kitchen that I never hear during the day. I spend a significant amount of time squinting up the darkened walkway, but I don't see anything. But I have the weirdest feeling come over me. It just sort of feels like something is up there. The dog still barks sporadically, sometimes jerking awake because of it. I think that I get like three hours of sleep. I wake up again at 6.30 to voices, but they're closer this time, sounding like they're actually in the same room as I'm in. I'm like, okay, I definitely need more sleep if I'm having another auditory hallucination, so I drive home that day to nap for a few hours. Now, I feel like I have to clarify something at this point. Auditory hallucinations when waking up are rare, and I think that I've had them maybe five times max before this in my entire life that I can remember at least. So as much as I'm trying to gloss over it, it's definitely weird. So, on the third night, which was yesterday, I'm like, okay, it's probably just all in my head. Still, I keep the kitchen lights on max and this time I turn on the lights above the walkway. I get to sleep at 1230 but then I'm startled awake two hours later when the dog freaks out, starts barking and growling facing towards the foyer on the other side of the staircase leading up the walkway. He then does something that he never did before this and runs into the foyer to see if something's there. I'm sitting there with my ears perked, my phone in one hand, wondering if I should call the police or not, but I don't hear anything and... He comes back like 30 seconds later, standing on the pullout next to me and staring at the same place that he was earlier. I'm officially spooked at this point. I'm still hearing stuff. I still feel like something is watching me. I start counting the taps in the kitchen and it's always three sets of three, which is comforting at first because I think it's an appliance. Except then I realize that I'm pretty sure that's a thing in the supernatural world and not a good thing, right? In any case, I, I get back to sleep at 5.30 in the morning. This time, though, I'm not woken at 6.30 by voices. Instead, at 7.30, a woman whispers my name directly into my ear, clear as day. I don't know if it's significant or if this happens in auditory hallucinations as well, but this time, it's only audible in my exposed ear since I'm sleeping on my side. Regardless, at this point, I'm done. I feed the dog, let him out, put him in his cage, drive home and sleep for four more hours. It's the fourth night now and currently midnight while I write this. I'm still hearing stuff around me even while I'm sitting here in the kitchen with a, a ton of lights turned on. Sometimes, I feel like I see things moving in my peripherals. And I kind of feel like I'm going crazy to be honest. So I... Just want to, I don't know, share everything that's happening here. Maybe someone could explain some of this and relieve me of my fears or perhaps confirm them. I'll be up tonight, I think, and I don't plan on sleeping. This happened when I was 17 years old. I'm 20 now. I'm from Bosnia and... I used to go fishing with my friends whenever I could. When the summer break began, we used to explore many rivers. Usually, we would encounter animals or people, but nothing special. Keep in mind, too, that legal driving age in Bosnia is 18, so we would usually take a bus to a location or just walk it. One night, though, me and my friends sat on a bus and went to a city not too far away, I won't tell you the name because it's a small country and I've always had a bit of a phobia of someone from the internet finding me. And anyways, we arrived and before exiting the bus, an old creepy drunk guy said something along the lines of, you boys going fishing? To which I replied, yeah, in the lake, and I gave the name. 
He added, well, good luck then. I hope you catch some fish. With a really creepy laugh tacked on at the end. We arrived at the lake, which was very beautiful, and we started fishing. At around 1.30, after we had had some beers, we could hear arguing in the distance. One of my friends took a flashlight and shined it into the distance, and as he went over a bush, somebody clearly was crouching down in it. As there were many of us, we weren't really too scared. Me and the friend with the flashlight went to investigate it, while the others stayed near the campfire. Upon arriving to the bush, we spotted the same old drunk guy crawling in the grass. We asked him what he was doing, to which he replied that he was hunting. We didn't see any weapon on him whatsoever, so I proceeded to ask him, what are you hunting without a weapon for? He got up and said, look, this is a coincidence, I'm going to get going, while sort of stumbling away. We returned and we tried to enjoy the rest of the night. At around 4am we heard somebody angrily shouting in the distance again. We turned around to spot this buff guy in a black shirt covered in tattoos. And behind him was the old guy. What do you think you're doing on my property? He said to us. So we were fishing and we didn't know this property was yours. In the argument I could see my friends packing the fishing rods and all the things that we brought. My friends made a run for it to the forest, leaving me and my other friend there. Okay, you're going to call your friends and tell them to come back or else you're not leaving, says the buff guy. I, of course, didn't want to do that as I did nothing wrong. We were quiet, just sort of talking, doing nothing to disturb anyone, and plus the river was like 300 meters away from any houses. My friend tells the man that we're going and starts to walk. But this is where it gets scary. The dude grabs my friend by the neck and starts arguing with him. I jumped in and hit the guy in the face and started running towards the road. He lets go of my friend and chases after me. And after running for about a minute, the dude gets tired. I end up exiting the trees and go into the street. I wait on a bench for some time and see my friend coming. He sits next to me and tells me that when the dude started chasing me, the old guy jumped on him with a hunting knife. He thankfully missed my friend and he ended up pushing the dude and running as well. But we called the cops after that, obviously. A patrol came and we gave our statement. We called our other friends and ended up meeting up with them. The cops explained to us that the part where we had apparently been was private property, but again, the fact that the guy grabbed my friend by the neck was not how he should have reacted. We ended up going home and nowadays we just sort of laugh at this story, but to be honest... It was a really close call. So, I want to share a story of an old house that I lived in when I was younger. It's a bit of a long one, so do brace yourselves. We moved in there as a family, my parents, my brother and I, when I was around seven. It was a semi-detached UK house with two bedrooms and a loft. The bedroom my brother and I shared had access to the loft via a standard door and a staircase leading up to a large loft ensuite. My father used to sleep and work there before he moved out, as my parents were separated for a long time before their divorce. While he still lived there, however, I became accustomed to the sounds of him walking in the loft and down the stairs to me in my brother's bedroom. This is important for later, so keep that in mind. Again, I knew inside out what footsteps sounded like when someone was in the loft or walking down the stairs to the bedroom. So, before my father moved out, a lot of stuff happened between him and my mother, and it was around this time that I remember starting to feel a, a deeply troubling energy whenever I was in the house. After he had left, I still continued to hear the footsteps of someone pacing up and down the loft and sometimes even down the staircase to the door where my brother and my bedroom was. But my mother often got up there to use the ensuite, so there were many occasions where I heard the pacing and went up thinking that I'd find my mother there, but the loft would be empty. I also heard these footsteps a lot in the evenings, all the way from downstairs in the living room. They were always heavy and sometimes would slow down or speed up. I dreaded when my mother would send me up there to get some wrapping paper or something else. I distinctly remember walking up to the landing with the main bathroom, master bedroom and my bedroom while still hearing these footsteps going back and forth. I'd reached the attic door and 
the minute that I would open it, it would always stop. Sometimes, when I felt brave, I'd do a sort of thorough check of the loft space and ensuite, again finding nobody there. This went on for months too, maybe even a year, and to add to the footsteps, the door which led to the loft began to sometimes open slightly and then slam shut. I put it down to the draft, despite no windows being open, and despite the force in which it would slam too. I also deeply considered that an eight-year-old was going crazy at the time. I thought maybe the divorce and the negative experiences in the house were making me see and hear things, and I was resolved to confide in my mother for help, which I didn't. But one day, though, my mother wanted to go for food shopping. There was a safe way about a 40-minute walk away from the house, but on that specific day, I was too tired to do the 40-minute walk and threw a tantrum adamant that I was going to stay home by myself. My brother and my mum left, and I sat down on the sofa to watch some TV. But the sofa was against the wall of the staircase leading up to the landing with the bedrooms. After about 20 minutes, I began to hear the footsteps pacing in the loft and started getting spooked. I remember thinking, it's all good, they'll stop soon, or if they don't, nothing bad will happen. There's nothing up there. And then they started coming down the loft stairs. At this point, I turned the TV volume way up. I consoled myself with the idea that this was just a usual thing, and I remember telling myself, it's okay, they'll stay there. But this time, they didn't. I started hearing them heavier, walking across my room. That feeling too, I'll never forget it, was like absolute horror, like someone was up there and now knew that I was alone. Again though, I thought, okay, as long as they stay a floor above, I'll be good. I calculated in my head that the steps should have reached the top of the staircase leading to my floor by now. I held my breath, heard nothing, and was about to dismiss it all as just stupidity, but then started walking slowly but loudly down the stairs just behind me. Now, to the right of me was the door entering the living room and I made the decision that I was not going to look because there was definitely something there and I could hear that there was something there. I started singing to myself, I know, sort of ridiculous, but remember I was eight years old. I sang Twinkle Twinkle Little Star so loudly over and over again and to be honest, I I don't really remember too much after that, apart from hearing a knock at the door after what felt like literally only a minute. Even though my brother and my mother were probably like only halfway to the Safeway, and then opening it to see both my mother and brother back from the shopping. That was really strange too, it was almost like, I don't know, time had just gone fast or something. The footsteps continued after that though, like they did before this day, as well as the door slamming. I never told anyone and we moved shortly after. I never brought it up again until I was about 11, but by then I had chalked these events down to my life at that house having a negative effect on my mental health. But my brother and I had gone to dinner with my dad at Pizza Express and we must have been talking spooky things at some point. I thought, uh, why don't I just tell them what I experienced in the house? I told the story in a brief way with not much detail, and I look up to see my brother literally go pale. All he said was, I heard them too, and he went on to describe the sound, the speed, the heaviness of the footsteps, the change of the direction, the door slamming, all of it. My father suggested that it was the neighbors due to the house being semi-detached, but even as an eight-year-old, I was thorough. I made sure at the time that I could differentiate from the sounds. I often heard the neighbors running or going up and down the stairs, and that just definitely wasn't this. Whatever this was, it was different. So this happened in New York City. Years ago, when I was a freshman in college, I was out partying one night with some friends. I wasn't drunk or on any hard drugs or anything, but I definitely smoked a blunt or two. At around 3am, we went our separate ways, and I got off the train and began walking home. I had to take a longer route home that night, because some train lines were under maintenance. 
when I got off the train I realized that I had to walk past the cemetery and I started to feel a bit uneasy about that but I wasn't afraid for any real reason. It was just sort of like, you know, cemetery is spooky sort of thing. In any case, about 10 blocks and I'm home. I always saw trucks lined up on the cemetery blocks too and being that it was a desolate area, I assumed truckers would park their trucks by the cemetery to take naps or sleep before continuing their routes. Back then, I really didn't think too much of it. A few minutes after getting off the train, I heard a faint sound of what I guessed was a car or a truck door being shut behind me. I turned around and I didn't see anything. I scanned my surroundings once quickly and didn't see any other people. Not ahead of me or behind me for as far as I could see anyway. I kept walking, this time a bit faster and about a minute later I hear footsteps behind me. I turned really quickly and I saw a man walking fast a few feet behind me. When he saw me turn, he began catcalling me by making kissing noises too. I was used to these catcalls, especially living in New York City. By my house, there would actually be a line of men on the corner every morning, waiting to be picked up for construction work, and every time I passed them to go to the store, I would get catcalled and a little bit harassed. So for the most part I just ignored him like I always did and I kept walking but definitely faster this time. A few seconds later he was running to catch up with me though and he was now at my side speaking to me in Spanish which I don't speak. He grabbed my arm tightly and began pulling me toward him but when I started screaming and fighting him off he pushed me up against the cemetery fence and in the midst of this my heart sunk to the floor as I thought that I was about to be assaulted or perhaps worse. Seconds later, he had me off my feet by both arms, but then I noticed his face turned completely white in the moonlight. It was a face of pure horror as he seemed to be looking past me into the cemetery, fixated on something. He let out a blood-curdling scream and he let me go. As I dropped to the ground and looked up, he was already across the street and running out of sight. Choking on tears, shaking beside myself, I picked myself up and I ran as fast as the last few blocks to my house as I could. I didn't turn to look inside that cemetery once, I did not turn around at all in fact. I didn't stop until I was home. To this day, I really don't know what happened that night and it's always perplexed me. I never took that train again or walked past that cemetery either and to be honest, I, I never told my parents to and only told a, a handful of friends over the years because to this day, like I said, I still don't understand what actually happened. But what I do know is that something probably saved my life that night. So I've been stressed the past few weeks. My mind is in deep thought over what happened during winter last year. I'm no stranger to hearing or seeing things too. Of course, I never felt a reason to tell anyone my experiences because there's always uncertainty behind what is seen or heard. A what if, if you will. Anyway, I'm from Texas and at the time I lived inside a house that had no central cooling with the temperature of the house being the outside temp or close to it most of the time. During last winter, it had been freezing outside. The weeks before that day, I kept hearing what sounded like someone calling my name throughout the house whenever no one was home, though. It was subtle, so I didn't think too much of it, always thinking that maybe I was just hearing things. My parents had just left the store for the groceries that day, while I felt a little uncomfortable being alone due to hearing a voice calling my name. But at the time, I thought, well, what's the worst that could happen? I hear my voice being called, I'll go and look, see nothing and watch the TV. Simple I thought. So they left the house and the house temperature felt extremely cold that day. So I laid back on the recliner that we had and put on a classic movie, covered myself in a blanket while wearing pajamas and a sweater, as comfortable as I could get. I remember feeling sleepy after getting comfortable, but then it happened. I heard a a guy's voice called my name. I pumped myself up. I said, let's do this. Got up, walked around the house, 
It's daylight outside, by the way. Snowing, too. And saw nothing like I expected. However, how could I get comfortable again, knowing once I relax that I would hear something again? We've all seen the movies where the person relaxes and thinks, I can let my guard down again, then everything goes downhill, right? So I made a deal with myself. I'll record myself sleeping. Either nothing will happen and I'll fall asleep, or I'll finally record it to show my parents that I'm not crazy. It's a win-win deal. Sadly, the outcome was what I hoped wouldn't happen. I put my phone onto a table that's used for drinks near the recliner, set it to record myself on the couch, slowly drifting off into sleep thinking nothing will happen while it's recording. I woke up what seemed to be maybe half an hour to an hour later to a loud crying from a woman's voice. Me being sort of drowsy, I looked around to find the source of the noise, and there was a hole beside the recliner. And I know it sounds weird, but the owner didn't lay the floorboard down correctly and it eventually broke. So we put a temporary board over the broke part, but it left a, a sort of small little hole because it didn't exactly fit. And the crying was coming from beside me and in exactly that direction of the hole. I looked directly at it, realizing what was happening, jumped straight up and backed away in shock. The sound faded. I questioned if what I had just heard could have been my waking up from a lingering dream or something. But the only way to confirm it is to check the recording still going. I collected my phone from the table, paused the recording. The thoughts ran through my mind while getting my headphones to listen closely. I thought, one, I'm going to hear nothing and realize that it was only a lingering dream, sit back down and laugh off my paranoia. Or two, I will hear it and confirm a dreading truth. I went outside because I didn't feel exactly comfortable inside anymore. The temperature was around 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Yes, I know, it's probably not that cold to some, but in Texas it's normally like 100 to 110 degrees. Even the power went out a few times during the winter for a good part of Texas. They weren't prepared for snowy weather. But I sat on the porch, headphones on, fast forwarding the video until I saw myself waking up and rewinded a few minutes before to see the truth. My heart raced with anxiety as I watched. In the video, I slept like normal, but then a noise came into the audio. It sounded like a, an eerie whine that became louder until the audio started cutting in and out like distortion. In the video, I woke up to the noise and looked around with sleepy eyes before looking at the floor and jumped up. I got chills at that and I waited outside in the freezing cold, waiting for my parents to come home. I didn't want to go back inside. What I did next, I'll have to explain my reasoning too. You see, I've been through a lot. Near-death experiences plenty. Poverty, an abusive father, and terminally ill mother. Yes, the parent that I have is my stepfather. And I wasn't really scared of too much back in those days, and I always thought that it was best to face my fear anyway. So I calmed down, and I went back inside. I went to the living room where it happened, and closed my eyes. My brother passed away when I was a teenager and sometimes when I'm going through hard times I'll speak to him as if he's there. I said, brother, I don't know what to do. I'm hearing noises and it's weighing on my mind. I can't sleep or relax even in daylight and I finally have proof that it's not inside my head. I love you and miss you and I'm going to keep trying. Feeling more relaxed after saying that, I started to say a prayer. I'm a Christian but I would be lying if I said that I followed my religion to every word. I'm not 100% on who or what God is or what religion is, so I pray pouring my heart out hoping God understands my ignorance and guides me from the trouble. I said in my prayer, please give me guidance, I understand people die and I'm not sure how death works. The crying I heard sounded like a woman in sorrow, it scared me at first. All I can do is pray, not for my own fear but to show whatever it is, guidance and love. Let it come out from the darkness into your light so that it ceases to suffer any longer. I took a deep breath after that and I opened my eyes. I no longer felt worried too. My heart felt at peace. I realized that sometimes fear is from ignorance of not knowing how it works. I hear a scary crying and think instantly of fear and ghost videos, scary movies, death. 
but I never think how it must feel to be stuck to a house or feel alone in some dark place. A family member or friend, neighbor to someone at one point. And writing this now, I really don't feel too stressed anymore. But I showed my parents the video and of course they felt fear and weren't sure how to feel about it. I made my final decision to end this story though and I decided it's better to accept what happened and move forward in life as there's too many aspects in life to fully comprehend everything. In any case, it really feels good to get this off my chest and whether or not people believe this or not is totally up to them. But I'm just grateful that you stuck around to listen to me and I can finally get some sleep now. Thanks again. So I work for my city's water department. My everyday job consists of repairing leaks or doing new installations for businesses and homes. There are two parts to our water department that keep everything running. Distribution, where I normally work, and production. Production deals with the chemical side of things. They chlorinate the water and do water sample checks. Production is also responsible for all of the upkeep of our water well sites and our water storage facilities like the tall water towers that you might have seen in your city. And mowing grass is also one of those responsibilities. Both parts of our department are extremely understaffed right now, so we sometimes give the production guys a hand with the grass when they need it. A couple of weeks ago it was my turn, and here is where the weirdness begins. So, my city is in central Louisiana with a population of about 45,000 people. We're surrounded by wooded area, no matter which way you travel into or out of town, you're going to see plenty of trees. As such, a lot of our well sites are located out in the boonies. Most of our city's trucks are four-wheel drive with mud grips because it's needed more often than not. In any case, I had four sites to cut that day. I headed out just before sunrise to the one at the end of the sort of long dirt road here where if trouble strikes your phone better be charged because no one is going to be able to hear you yell for help. Surprisingly this isn't where my strange encounter took place either. But the sun was rising as I was approaching my first sight and on the road ahead of me stepped out a doe with two fawns. Excitedly I hurried to snap some pictures to my surprise though, the mama and her babies were not really afraid of the loud rumbling diesel that I was driving. The speckled fawns made their way across the path as the mum calmly watched me in the truck. Once the babies were safely across, she looked back the way that she had come and then joined the little ones in the tree line on the opposite side of the road. Now, I breezed through my moan pretty quickly, loaded the equipment back onto the trailer and texted my mum the pictures of the deer as I headed back into town. My mum messaged me back saying, I've read that deer are an omen of good fortune. Looks like you're going to have a good day. Be safe and I love you. And I did have a great day. I knocked out the two next sites without issue and everything was going really smoothly. That is, until I reached the gate of the last place that I had to mow. McKeithen's site is the biggest one that we have that's closer to town. It's about the size of a football field. It's not in the middle of nowhere, but it's definitely on the outskirts of the city. There's normally plenty of traffic that travels the road there, so there's really no feeling of seclusion, even though it's surrounded by thick woods on three sides. I've cut this spot plenty of times though, but that day, that day felt different. I pulled the truck through and hopped out to lock the gate behind me. Immediately too, I felt like I needed to get back into the truck as quick as I could. I made my way down the driveway to park near the tower like I have many times before. But after I parked and killed the truck, everything just felt really heavy and really silent too. I don't know how long I sat until I was able to will myself to open the door and get out. Instantly though, I felt eyes on me. The feeling was coming from the back right corner of the field outside of the fence, just in the tree line where the palmetto bushes grow. I calmed my nerves and reminded myself that I was surrounded by an 8 foot unclimbable fence with gate locked and everything. So yeah, if someone had a gun then they could have shot me if they wanted to I suppose, but they weren't going to actually get to me. If the barbed wire at the top of the fence didn't get them, a face full of weed eater, string blades would. So I jumped on the zero turn and took off mowing, keeping an eye on the back corner during every pass. After about two hours, it took multiple runs due to the overgrowth. 
I had the entire front mode and it was time to hit the back by the creepy corner. I was about to head that way too, but the mower blades just wouldn't engage. I had to take covers off, pull grass out of the belts and rip grass out from under the deck. I had to grease the pulleys and do all sorts of troubleshooting. I finally got the blades going, but then the gaslight came on. I didn't realize it until later, but I don't know. It felt like something was doing everything that it could to keep me from going to that part of the lot. I finally got everything up and running though and mowed the back as quickly as possible, doing everything that I could to keep my side on the fence. I finally got done, loaded the mower. I still had to do a little bit of weed eating, but that was about it. But when the weed eater wouldn't start, I knew then that it was time to go. I hadn't had an issue with it all day, but that was the last hint that I needed to get out of there. So after pulling out of the gate and locking it behind me, I turned out into the highway to head home, but not before looking at the back corner one last time. So after pulling out of the gate and locking it behind me, I turned out onto the highway to head home, but not before looking back at the corner one last time. And that was when I finally saw it. The unmistakable shadow of a figure standing in the palmettos. It wasn't trying to hide or make itself unseen. It was there for sure. Being at a, a safe distance from it too, I stopped and watched. And it moved. It moved to the side as if it were bending to try and see me better at the road. Now, it had no distinguishing features. No hair, no clothes. Just a sort of person-shaped mass. I decided to get as far away from there as I could. The thought that I could have been so close to it for so long and never saw it really sent chills to my core. It obviously also confirmed to me the feelings that I had the whole time that I was there. I called my mum later that night and told her what had happened and she told me that she did some more reading about seeing the deer and learned that they are a sign of protection. Some people believe that a deer means that a higher power is watching over you. I don't know about all that but after my mum told me that I couldn't help but think what if I had not seen the deer that morning? Would I have even seen the shadow? Would it have been able to do something to me? Why did it choose to show itself to me right at the end there? Is there something about me or is it tied to that part of the woods? A thousand questions were running through my head obviously but my mum texted me even later that night. She was sitting out on her back steps on my little old hometown when she heard some rustling near her storage shed. She shone her phone light into the dark and what stands there but a deer. No, deer had never come into the backyard before like that. But that night, a large deer stood tall, staring back at my mum. She told me that she felt like it was there as if to say, It's okay, he's safe, don't worry, we got him. But anyway, like I said, I don't know about any of that, but what I do know is that I saw something strange that day. I don't know what it was, I don't know what it was doing there, but it was definitely there and it gave me the creeps. I've always been a, a fan of camping. Since I, currently 22 and male, was a child, the forest was pretty much like my second home. And so I decided my roommate, who happens to be one of my best friends, should definitely try it out too and, of course, he agreed. We chose a spot in a forest in the north of our country, close to my parents' native town. During the day, everything was normal and we actually had quite a lot of fun. But what happened, happened at night at around 3am though. We were awoken up by, I don't know, what seemed to be the sound of people singing. Now, I swear that we hadn't brought much alcohol and we definitely don't do any drugs, so this was pretty much as weird as it gets. But it almost seemed like a religious chant or something. Of course, we immediately got out of the tent to see what was going on. There was nothing around us, as far as my friend's awful flashlight could show us anyway. The singing was further away, but not too far from what I could tell. We didn't actually have time to think whether we wanted to go and check it out or go back to sleep though, because a mere few moments later, something really quickly ran right beside me. It was literally like a wind breeze, but 
strong enough to actually knock my friend off his feet. I still have no idea what it was, but I swear to you here and now that when I looked in the direction it went, I swear that I saw a naked man over two meters tall. It was only a second though. Afterwards, it disappeared. I went to check on my friend and he was unconscious. Of course, I immediately panicked and ran for a place with at least one bar on my phone so that I could call for help. I found a spot and I began dialing and I'm quite certain I saw a hooded person stalking me 10 meters away, but he also disappeared quickly. I assumed this one was because of adrenaline rushing through my veins and the darkness surrounding everything. I probably just saw something, but I rushed back to my friend and stood there until the authorities arrived. As I'm telling you this, it's been over two weeks since then. My friend went into a coma, but the doctors are optimistic. And like I said, I still have no idea what the heck that was. I don't know whether the hooded man was real or a figment of my imagination, but the tall naked guy, he was definitely real. I'm sure of that. As you can imagine though, I don't know what to make of any of this. If you have any idea of what this could have been, then I would love to hear it. I would love somebody to please make sense of any of this. So I've always been the skeptic type, never truly believing in entities or paranormal things in general, partially because of the way that I was brought up. I never really got to talk about paranormal things. If something did happen, I would just sort of shrug it off or explain it somehow. But this was the beginning or a string of happenings in my home which I just couldn't explain. This specific occurrence happened when I was 12. It's so vivid in my mind, it feels like it almost happened yesterday. It was a fairly normal day. My mum in the study room, my dad in his room, and my brother also in his room. I left my brother to go and grab some snacks for us. I'd always dreaded going into the kitchen as it's behind the deck, and the deck is only surrounded by windows, with no blinds, curtains, or anything, completely exposed to the outside. I grabbed some random snacks and decided to sit at the table for a bit. I still don't know why. I remember starting to snack on chips that I had when suddenly I hear a knock. It was faint, but you could definitely hear it. At first, I didn't think much of it because the roof of our deck is like this sort of plastic material and birds always hop around on it, creating the same sort of noise. So I continued to munch on what I was eating, not looking up at all. A second knock sounds, much more firm, like an actual knock, but I still don't think anything of it and continue to eat. I love food, if you couldn't tell. I just didn't look up, though. It just sort of registered in my mind that, oh yeah, that kind of sounded like a knock, which honestly sounds really dumb thinking about it now, but it could have been anything to me at that time. A third knock sounds, and I finally look up. And there, at the window, facing my direction, was an extremely tall thing. It was levitating off the ground, obviously. It was wearing a dark black cloak with a hood which was torn and sort of ripped. I couldn't see its face. Maybe there was no face at all, in fact. It was complete darkness around where the face was supposed to be. It sort of looked like, I don't know, I know it's cheesy to say, but like the Grim Reaper in a way. Uh, I was terrified, frozen in place. I stared at it for what seemed like forever and with the blink of an eye it just vanished. I sprinted to my mum and tried to tell her about it. She was a bit worried because I'd never had an overactive imagination and I'd never talked or brought up these kinds of things with her. But she just chalked it up to not having enough sleep and I don't know, maybe she was right but I'm really not sure. It felt very real to me. I even tried to visually show her, but she still looked like she didn't believe me. Also, I didn't really bother trying to tell my dad or brothers, because if my mum didn't believe, then there's no way they would. But I do know what I saw that day, and the fact that this happened in broad daylight was, I don't know, even more unsettling. I had always thought that the paranormal things are more prone to happening at night or dark hours, right? 
And the fact that after that event, more things happened and maybe that they're connected, it always just makes me feel uneasy, but I really don't know. I'm glad to say that we moved out of that house a year later due to other reasons and this strange feeling that I had in my chest just lifted after moving out. But if someone has any info on these sorts of things, I would gladly appreciate it. Like I said, if somebody could please help me make sense of any of this, then I would be forever grateful. When I was 15 or so, me and my group of friends all slept over at the leader of our friend's group's house. This dude lived in the most absolutely rural area of our rural town, basically in the middle of the woods, a house just absolutely surrounded by thick walls of trees. In the evening, we decided to go out and start a bonfire deep in the woods, so we packed up, got all of our materials, and went straight out into the woods. On the way to the spot that we'd be making our campfire at, he told us about how messed up and creepy his woods are, and the numerous things that he's seen. White, skinny figures peeking around his shed, staring at him and running off when he looked at it, screaming and whispers from the woods, figures watching him, all that stuff. It definitely set the mood pretty well. By around 7 at night, we had the campfire set up and it was pitch black outside as it was the middle of winter in New Hampshire. I can still remember just how creepy the whole vibe was that night too. You could not see a single thing besides the ring of light coming out from the fire. Everything else was just a black wall of nothingness. And the sound of the forest was so quiet that it was almost deafeningly loud if we didn't talk. We ended up needing more firewood or whatever that we were using for the campfire, along with some other things, so the leader takes me with him to go get it. Without a flashlight or any light source, me and him walk the mile and a half long trail back to his house in complete and utter darkness. And it was all good. We were talking, joking with each other, having a good time just hanging out when the first noises started. He immediately made me stop talking too. To my left and my right was a bunch of different sounds. Screaming, laughing, talking and whispering, shouting, people saying inaudible words. It sounded like there was maybe 20 people around us. The natural light vision had set in a decent amount and I looked over at my friend who had his head down and didn't say a single word. Known for being a complete goofball and a wild funny dude, I had never seen him look so shaken and serious in my life. He had this look to him that still kind of haunts me to this day. As we knew him and he portrayed himself as this fearless leader type of our group. And seeing him so shaken up and afraid was really, really unsettling. I started to say something along the lines of, What the heck is that? Before he cut me off and told me to be quiet, face forward, and to not pay attention to any of the sounds. I did what he said, and the next three or so minutes was uncomfortable and terrifying. I remember feeling sick to my stomach, in fact. By the time that we reached his house, the sounds had sort of dissipated and stopped. We both grabbed what we needed to grab in silence, and that's when I could really listen to the sheer quietness of that night. No birds, no sticks falling, no sound. Absurdly silent. We walked back to the campsite and nothing else occurred that night, but it is still the most unsettling and bizarre experience that I have almost no explanation of. This could be a paranormal experience, although I'm still not ready to say that I know for sure. Whatever it was though, it definitely had me terrified. So every summer, my family and some close friends would all travel from Southern California to the eastern Sierra Nevada mountains along the CANV border to the town of Bridgeport. If you've ever been, it's a really cool area. A big biker route is there, excellent outdoor camping and hiking in Yosemite high country rich in wildlife, 
crazy old history with native tribes and the gold rush of the west. It has Bodie Ghost Town nearby and my favorite is the world class trout fishing. Mark Twain even once stayed in the town way back in the day which I thought was pretty cool. The town is small and has your typical 20 building Main Street USA to match the feel, all surrounded by rivers, lush meadows with cattle and horse ranches, and absolutely gorgeous wooded snow-capped mountains. We would often camp up near Twin Lakes just outside of town about 10 miles, but always made a point to go to town for dinner at this bar Reno's for pizza and beer as well, at least once during the trip. So, one night we do this, and afterwards we're on our way back to camp at twilight. Just light enough to make out the peaks on the horizon, but still densely dark with billions of stars out in force. This road back to the camping area would sort of zigzag through the square cut properties of ranch land. It's a narrow two lanes edged by barbed wire and an irrigation channel and minimal street lights, if any at all. Literally you can only think of one installed by the dude ranch out there. So we drive back to the camp having to use our lights due to the dark and making sure to keep an eye out for deer. And when we finally pull into the camp, my mum immediately asks, did you see that kid in the swimsuit on the side of the road? Perplexed and a little amused by the idea, I say, no, where was this? On the other side of the road, near the cows, he was shirtless walking along the road. I had been driving behind her and my dad, and there was no way that I could have missed this had someone been there. Nobody in our car saw him too, and my dad said that he didn't either when she initially saw him. Which, if I'm being honest, is not really shocking for my dad though. However, also not shocking would be for my mum seeing something paranormal. It always seemed to follow her for whatever reason, and she was dead, excuse the pun, serious, even described the color of the shorts, his hairstyle, said that he was walking the same direction that we were traveling so she couldn't see his face and had to have been in his 20s. So we half-jokingly jumped to that conclusion that maybe it was in fact a ghost. After all, it was dark and late, nobody else had seen him, and even in the summer, the Sierra is high enough in elevation and has crazy enough weather to easily kill someone who wasn't prepared for the cold night, especially shirtless in swim trunks. On a clear night in August, I've woken up in the teens for temperature, and where she was describing was in the literal middle of nowhere in those fields. It takes us about 20 minutes just to drive it at a good speed, let alone walk it to camp in the dark, but I guess anything is possible. Anyway, the next morning we get up and learn about my idiot friend, someone who got scratched in a previous story that I've told, left the cooler out after the rest of us went to bed, and a bear got a buffet out of us, so... We decided that we'll make the most of it and go back to town for supplies, some further fishing spots, and get dinner again. This time on the way back to the camp, I'm driving in front of my parents, zigging and zagging through the fields when all of a sudden there's a bright set of headlights on my tail. Looking back, I could tell that this had to be some sort of lifted truck, maybe a Bronco or similar rearing up on my SUV. So close at times that I thought he was about to ram me. I start speeding up a little at first, but this car stays right on me. I'm starting to get annoyed and concerned. After all, this was a two-lane road at night that anyone wanting to pass could very easily and safely do so. And there isn't any area that you could really pull over without risking pulling into a ditch and getting stuck. So I continue speeding up, but I'm getting concerned because I know the hills are coming up and there are deer by the thousands in this area. But this car just keeps pressing. My wife, then girlfriend, and friends start getting a little freaked as well, thinking about the backwoods human being that is pulling this, and this continues through the fields until I get to the final turn before it goes from meadows to woods, and I get a really heavy gut feeling, almost like a scream in my head to slow down. So, do or die, I start pressing the brakes hard, fully expecting this truck to ram us, as I do this, we're coming around the corner and, sure enough, there's a pack of six or so deer in the middle of the road. I was immediately a little shaken. It's always a little startling when you see animals out in the dark while driving, especially big ones, and then it dawns on me that 
I'm not being blinded anymore, and we definitely didn't get hit. I look back in the mirror, and the lights are gone. Just gone. No dust in the rear brake lights from a vehicle pulling off the road. Nothing screaming by us in the other lane, and no road for them to have even turned off on, or headlights lighting up the trees or area or anything. And then I see my folks coming driving up behind us. All of us are dumbfounded trying to figure out where the heck this person went. The deer clear the road and we make the rest of the drive to camp. An adrenaline admittedly gets me a bit irritated so I start ranting off about how stupid this guy was and how we could have died and blah blah blah. Really making everyone feel good right? When we get out of the cars my mum immediately starts giving me the typical parent talk but... I get even more angry when she calls me an idiot for taking off like that on such a dangerous road in the dark. And how lucky I am to not have killed us with all those deer and how I need to be more careful, etc. Well, if that guy hadn't have been riding my tail so tightly, it wouldn't have been such an issue, I say. What are you talking about, she responds. There wasn't anyone behind you. Oh, how the tables have turned. Luckily for me, my wife and friends had experienced everything with me and they start chiming in about the truck and I start talking about how I finally had enough and listen to my gut and reason, deciding to slow down just as we came to find this deer and how the truck was just gone after that. It gave my mum chills and she apologised but told me to be careful next time but then started laughing and saying how weird the trip had been. I'll give this to my mum that she never did call us crazy for what we experienced in life, which is something that I think a lot of parents neglect to do for their kids. It's funny too because I've always heard similar experiences from country towns back east or folklore of ghost trucks and thought that how stupid it all sounded. But now, after experiencing it, man, it is dangerous. Plain dangerous. I'd never wish that on anyone. This road hasn't given us any issues before or since then too, but I'll admit that I drive it with a lot more caution these days. I always wonder though if the shirtless guy and the truck were somehow connected, but never found anything out about it. I guess in the end, only God knows. So I grew up in Orange County, CA, but there were some real wild areas around us, believe it or not. In high school, we went out of this place called Black Star Canyon in the Cleveland National Forest. Big, densely wooded area of oak that stretches from OC to San Diego, almost to the border even. It also contains Marine Corps Base Camp, Pandeliton, and... Anyways, we had been told that it was haunted growing up. Turns out, true story, there was a, a tribe up there that was slaughtered in the 1800s by hired four trappers because they kept stealing the Mexican ranchers horses for meat. But for a dumb set of high schoolers, we planned a night hike to this place. My friends and I did stuff like this all the time, but I consider myself pretty skeptical, and luckily most of us were pretty level-headed. This area is pretty well known for mountain lions too, so... We were all on guard and in agreement to turn around at any sign, even if just one of us wanted to. So, the way the trail works, you park at a forestry gate and start to walk along an old asphalt sort of narrow road that's mostly dirt from when there was sparse horses in the 50s or 60s before the floods washed them out and the land was committed to NFS, eventually turning to a full hiking trail. Along this road is a line of barbed wire as well with all kinds of signs warning you not to cross. So, here we are, typical idiots walking a road on a hardly slivered moon pitch black night after midnight and not using our flashlights to add to the flare. And well, as we go an adventure deeper and deeper down this road, which we'd never been on mind you, I keep seeing what appears to be a cowboy leaning on the wooden fence posts holding the barbed wire just kind of leaning on it but distinctly looking at us. I'm talking like a full-blown cowboy brimmed hat just leaning but it's sort of just a silhouette out of the side of my eye and every time that I look straight on there's nothing. I'm telling myself that I'm being illogical and 
push it off as a trick of the eyes to keep my cool, but I keep seeing this guy every ten or so posts that don't say anything to the others. We get to a point where we've been walking for maybe over an hour and debate on heading back, just because of the time. Just then though, my friend goes, yeah, I keep thinking that I'm seeing a cowboy along the fence line. I instantly felt my stomach drop out of me. I couldn't believe it. These were plain wooden fence posts, maybe a typical four feet tall or so with mostly field behind them. No way that that looks like a person, so I open up about it also and we all agree to turn around. But just then my other buddy starts flipping out, ripping his shirt off, screaming about getting stung by something. We're all kind of confused looking at him like he's crazy, but he insists that a bee or something just stung him. So we turn our lights on his back and watch as three distinct scratches from sort of stretching from one shoulder diagonal to the opposite hip, even drawing blood, were on his back. We were done, needless to say, after that, but we made it back to the car without any further incident. Now, you can probably argue the shadow was coincidence in the dark and shapes playing tricks on our eyes. Sure, I'll give you that much. But throw in the scratch in a way that we'd watched happen right as we were discussing this ghost cowboy. And in a way that there's just no possible way he could have done that to himself. And none of us standing in a circle did it to him. There has to be something going on, right? This area ended up being used by Jack Osborne's show Haunted Highway in his pilot episode too. It's pretty cool and I've been back since then but only in the day. California has more to it than you'd imagine I suppose but this is just one story of many that I've experienced out here. So, this encounter actually isn't mine. It was told to us. And the guy who told us this, his name was Mark. Mark is a man that specializes in removing asbestos. Being a man that works in a trade, he probably has seen and heard some strange things in his time. And well, Mark came to remove some, as you guessed it, asbestos from our kitchen ceiling. He had to set up a test first to see if the asbestos was dangerous or not. This roughly took around an hour. My mum made him a cup of tea. They both sat down in the living room and began a conversation that led to the following story while waiting for the test to be done. It was a normal day in the trade. Wake up, get ready, head out. Mark had a job located in a sort of loft or attic this day. So he wasted no time and got straight to the house that needed work. Upon arrival, Mark knocked into the house and was greeted by a woman who was the wife of the man of the house. Mark explained who he was and what he does and why he was there. He also specified that he needed to speak with her husband for whatever reason. The lady then told Mark that he was not at home and hasn't been so for like three days. Mark then questioned the lady about her husband. He's been missing for three days now. He does this from time to time. He'll just disappear out of the blue and won't have contact with anyone for several days, she said. Okay, that's weird. Maybe he's been having an affair? Anyhow, Mark told the lady that he had to start the job today, so she let him in and she had no other choice really. Mark then heads up into the loft with his tools, and this is where it gets really creepy. Mark is instantly greeted with the body of the husband hanging from the attic ceiling. The husband? He wasn't missing at all. He was in fact in the attic for three days straight, dead. The man had unfortunately ended himself and must have been planning it for a while if the disappearing was a regular recurrence. But the thought of even going to sleep while your husband is above your head like that? That's a crazy thought. I'm really sorry to whoever has experienced something like this or to anyone who has lost someone to suicide like this. But I felt compelled to share this story because I guess... But we should always be grateful for those in our lives. So to set the scene, it was my significant other, our two-year-old, and myself in a one-bedroom apartment. 
The two-year-old's bed was close to the wall by the door and our bed was on the other side of the room but to where I could see our two-year-old and also see the bathroom door which was located just outside the room. So it first started out with, I don't know, like minor bad feelings. At the usual walk into the apartment and feel that something is off sort of vibe. Just bad vibes all around. One night though, while we were sleeping, I had woken up to a strange feeling that our two-year-old was up to something that she shouldn't have been. The room is completely dark, so I sit up to have a sort of look around and almost immediately this small shadow catches my eye. It's my two-year-old. She's standing at the entrance of the bathroom looking back at me and then proceeded to sidestep into the bathroom out of view. I wake up my significant other and ask them, Hey, wake up. Why is our two-year-old out of their bed? How did they climb out? What are you talking about? They're in their crib, asleep. My eyes finally adjusted to the dark and I see my two-year-old sleeping peacefully in their crib. My heart starts picking up pace at this point as I'm trying to figure out who did I just see walk into our bathroom. So I get out of bed and I rush into the bathroom ready to catch whoever it is. I flip on the light but the bathroom is completely empty. It's just me staring at my reflection in the mirror. I turn off the light and head back to bed confused about what had just happened and not too sure what I saw. Fast forward a few nights and I'm still thinking about what just happened. But there I am in my bed next to my significant other with two year old sound asleep. Again I wake up to this strange feeling like we're being watched. I open my eyes, my body is still, I'm paralyzed, trapped in my own body. And my eyes search across the room and I look at the door to our bedroom and what I saw made my heart stop. There was this man at our bedroom door but something about him was off completely like he was something otherworldly in a man's body he was more shadow than detail and his posture hunched like he was trying to be quiet like he was stalking prey the shadow man begins to creep towards me lurching closer to our bed my mind is racing i'm thinking tonight's the night an invader has finally entered our home and i was the only one awake I start planning my attack and what I'm going to do to defend my family, but my body is still immobilized. The intruder, though, then does the unthinkable. He places one foot on my bed, then the other, and slowly starts creeping higher and higher up the bed. He's standing over me, and in the quick moment of fear that I was able to break out of and kick both my legs up towards the shadow man, hoping to catch him by surprise and ready to leap at him, as I kicked up... I felt the weight of my blanket fly off my body. I wasn't going to wait to hear the sound of a thud as he fell back. I was in fight or flight and my only focus was jumping on this thing as fast as possible and keeping my family safe. My violent kick wakes my significant other up in panic. I get up ready to pounce when I see that there's no one there. What is going on? There was a man in our room. I kicked him. He was right there. The room is empty and dark. No man, no intruder, no sound. The silence is broke by my wife telling me to check the rest of the apartment. And after I looked around, there was nobody there. I go back to bed and try to sleep, but my adrenaline was still pumping, so sleep wasn't really on the table that night. A few months after this event, we decide to move and upgrade to a bigger place to live and since moving there, it hasn't been any of the bad vibes at the apartment. No shadow man, no little girl, just the three of us, thankfully. Growing up in the 90s, I spent a lot of time outside just playing with the neighborhood kids. I didn't live in the greatest neighborhood though, so I couldn't really go out exploring, but all of my neighbors had kids my age, except one. It was an old house with a garage across the yard and stuff piled up so high in the windows that you couldn't see inside. The only noticeable objects were an old Barbie camper and a teddy bear with a missing ear. I knew that somebody was living there though because their ugly and I mean ugly red Chevy car would leave the driveway right at noon and wouldn't come back until like 9pm. 
And one night it came back and the next day there was a boy standing in the yard shouting and waving at me. I was playing in an old dip in my backyard where a tree had been cut down when I saw him. I remember sort of being confused as well but I was a kid and was excited to meet someone new that was my age. I found out his name was Brandon and I would always invite him to play outside after school. My mum didn't question me about my new friend so she let him come play in the backyard. I never saw him at school and he said that his grandma taught him from the house. I didn't want to play with the other neighborhood kids as much as I wanted to play with Brandon so the two of us formed our own little group and we played in that dip in my backyard. Nobody really questioned it until I told my mum that I wanted to have school at my house like Brandon. She finally asked me where I met Brandon and I told her that he lived in the dirty house on Harrison. I remember the look on my mum's face being confused and concerned at first but then she laughed in my face and told me that I was being ridiculous. Brandon was my imaginary friend because nobody had lived in that house since the 70s. I got mad at her and said that I would prove that Brandon was real and that he would be outside the next day. But he never showed up. In fact, I waited for him every day for quite some time, but I never saw him again. Eventually, we moved across town into an apartment and I made new friends and forgot about Brandon, but... A few years ago I felt nostalgic and decided to go for a drive through my old neighborhood. Not much had changed and seeing the old neighborhood made me happy and brought back a lot of fun memories until I passed that old house that is. It was obviously abandoned but after all these years the old Barbie camper and the teddy bear with the missing ear were still in that window. I saw that and laughed at how I'd stuck to the idea that my imaginary friend was real until I saw my ball. An old ball with my name written on it in big black ink was clearly visible from the window. The rainbow colors made it stick out like a sore thumb. I had lost that ball around the same time that I'd first met Brandon. And I mean, maybe one of the neighborhood kids had stolen it years ago and had hidden it away and I just now saw it and took notice of it. Maybe Brandon was just a figment of my overactive childhood imagination. Or maybe there was someone watching me back then and I was too innocent to see anything else other than a new friend. Thinking about it does creep me out a bit, but more than anything, I wish that I just had some answers. I mean, if he really was real, if he was another kid playing a prank, or if he was a lost spirit and it bothers me that I'll never really have the answers. But I'll always have the memories, I guess, if they're accurate. As creepy as the memories are, they do make me happy and pique my curiosity, but I do have to wonder if maybe there really was a kid there, and maybe I was being coaxed into something. Who knows? So, I haven't really shared this, but I had an experience about a year ago now that I just cannot stop thinking about. You see, I was fast asleep but having horrible nightmares. Nightmares are nothing new for me, being former military and current firefighter EMT. But these weren't the typical reliving bad days nightmares. They were vivid dreams about bad things happening to friends and family, things that never happened in real life. I woke up drenched in a sweat and immediately became aware of a a large black figure leaning over me and another one seated in a, a chair across the room. I immediately thought, so this is what sleep paralysis is like because I've never experienced it before. But I quickly realized that I wasn't actually paralyzed. I could in fact move. Once I moved my arm, the figure leaning over me seemed to notice this as well, stood up and took a step back. Then both figures just faded away. Now, I've had paranormal experiences my entire life, but there have only been two or three times that truly terrified me, and that was definitely one. It happened once, and I'd never seen the figures or had those nightmares since that night, and I thought that I would open it for discussion to see what other people think might have happened that night.
In 2019, I had bought my sister and I tickets to see 21 Pilots in Oklahoma City. At the time, I was a 20-year-old petite woman. I'm a super fan of their music, so made my sister pack and be ready to line up at the venue at around 2 or 3 a.m. to get decent spots in the pit. We got there and were greeted by other fans and had a pretty good time. I was able to park my car in a lot pretty close to the venue and got away with it until about 5 or 6 in the morning when the police or venue management, I can't remember which, told us that anyone parked on that lot would be towed if not moved in the next hour. At that time, the venue management had made an actual line clear up to the door. My sister didn't have her license at the time and we were able to become acquainted with some of the people in line. So I felt comfortable for her to stay in line while I found somewhere near to the park. I fast forward to me finding a Sonic that was close by and I figured that I could get away with free parking. I started the close to a mile walk back to the venue. I then found an alleyway that looked to be one of those sort of nightlife streets that are connected to bars. Since it was broad daylight and I knew that I would save time going this route, I wasn't apprehensive about taking the alleyway back. About halfway through the alleyway, I saw a thin man no later than maybe in his 40s sitting at one of the bar's back patios. When he saw me, he made a joke about a pillow I was carrying. My sister had texted me and asked me to bring one back so that she could take a nap before the concert. He then asked me where I was headed, in which I stupidly told him the concert downtown. He asked me if I wanted some drugs, in which I replied no, and then asked if he could come with, which I lied and told him that it was sold out. This entire exchange I kept walking while he was talking to hopefully shake him off or show no interest in the conversation. When I had reached the end of the alleyway, I had a bad feeling that I was being followed, so when I turned the corner, I quickly jogged to hopefully gain some distance between us if that was the case. And unfortunately, I was correct. I remember hearing fast footsteps following behind me, and then abruptly stopping when I turned to look behind me. It was almost like a movie where he would rush behind something when I turned, thinking that I didn't see him. And at this point, I panicked and started trying to spot the closest store to me. It was 5.30 or 6am at this point, so anything that I did pass was closed, plus I was in a suburban area with more apartment buildings than stores. I turned another corner and saw a man was coming out of his home. I hurried up to the man and remembered asking him if he could help me because I was scared and felt unsafe because there was someone following me. At this point, the scrawny man from the alley had gained on me and was a few feet away from us. The man following me then began telling the guy that I was asking for help and that I was a liar and to not listen to a man. The guy I asked for help looked at me and then the creep and told me, sorry I can't help you and proceeded to close his door on my face. I had never, and don't think ever, to this day felt so utterly helpless in my life. I turned to the creep guy and pled with him to please leave me alone. He kept telling me that I wasn't going anywhere and I wasn't going to the concert, and a bunch of other threatening comments. By some luck, I was able to spot a group of people in 21 Pilots merch across the street, and sprinted across and started walking next to them. I quickly told them what was happening and if I could walk with them to the venue, and they told me yes. I think the creepy man lost interest in me after that, and I saw his walking slowly back in the opposite direction. I was able to make it back to the venue fine, but immediately broke down upon seeing my sister. I thanked my new acquaintances and called the cops. I was told he does that a lot and he's harmless. I was told by the venue's bodyguards that they would walk me to my car after the concert, but upon returning to the same spot for them to do so, they weren't there. To say that I was pretty disappointed on how it was handled is an understatement. It still freaks me out too, to this day, how easily I could have been taken, or if I'd even be here to tell anyone this story, if it had gone any differently.